Thank you for your patience. I'm Councilmember Stephen Levin, Chair of the Committee on General Welfare, and I want to thank you all for coming out this morning for today's very important hearing on HRA's domestic violence shelters, which we're holding just a few days before the start of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'd like to thank my colleague and co-chair, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, for joining uh, this hearing today and for her commitment to promoting gender equity in our city. In addition to our oversight topic on HRA domestic violence shelters, we will also be considering Bill Intro 152, which I'm sponsoring in relation to requiring the Department of Social Services to report on families with children in shelter. This report would shed light on the average length of stay for families disaggregated by the type of shelter that they are in, as well as metrics concerning school enrollment and attendance for children living in shelter. This information would allow us to better track data concerning homeless families including many of those fleeing domestic violence. Domestic violence is considered to be one of the leading causes of homelessness in New York City. For survivors of domestic violence that require shelter, HRA oversees the city's system of emergency domestic violence shelters. HRA's Office of Domestic Violence provides emergency shelter, transitional housing programs, and support services for survivors of domestic violence and their children. HRA's domestic violence shelter locations are kept confidential to ensure that clients are protected. Under state law, local social services districts, such as New York City, must provide temporary emergency shelter for survivors of domestic violence. However, state law limits the length of stay at these shelters to 180 consecutive days. After the 180th day time limit expires, after the 180 day time limit expires, there are, t are limited options for domestic violence survivors who require additional shelter and have not been able to relocate into permanent housing. This time limit can put domestic violence survivors in a very precarious situation. Many domestic violence survivors end up seeking shelter within DHS, which do not provide the same level of services as HRA DV shelters. Currently, there are almost 60,000 individuals in DHS shelters which include 12,240 families with children. In 2016, among the families with children entering the DHS system each month, an average of 31% had a history of domestic violence. Although HRA can refer clients to transitional housing programs, such resources are very limited. We've heard from advocates that a number of domestic violence survivors will remain homeless, or return to their abusers due to the lack of affordable housing options and limited access to services specific to their needs in the DHS shelters. This is a reality that we must change and that we have an obligation to, as the city, address with every resource that we have. Today, the committees will examine HRA's domestic violence shelter system, including whether there is sufficient capacity to meet the needs of survivors. We'd also like to explore what happens when survivors time out and must enter the general homeless shelter system. Um, in addition, the DHS system does not provide the same level of confidentiality that the DV system does. The committees will also examine what the city is currently doing to enhance domestic violence services, including on-site mental health services and other wraparound services to ensure that survivors are set up for safety and success. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today, Councilmember Brad Lander, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, Councilmember and Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, and of course, my co-chair, Helen Rosenthal. Uh, I would like to also thank the staff of the General Welfare Committee, Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel, Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, Natalie Omery, Policy Analyst, Dohini Sampura, Unit Head, Julia Haramis, Finance Analyst, and the staff of the Women and Gender Equity Committee for putting this hearing together. I would also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and my Legislative Director, Elizabeth Adams, and my Constituent Services Director, Deidre Cheatham. I will now turn it over to Councilmember Rosenthal for her opening remarks. Thank you so much, Chair Levin. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, and I want to thank Chair Levin of the Committee on General Welfare for holding this hearing with us today. There are some who say that domestic violence is 
a somewhat sanitized phrase that does not paint a complete picture. Their vernacular is, their suggested vernacular is individual terrorism. I bring this up to validate the fact that victims of gender-based violence live in fear of their abuser every single day. And we cannot fully tackle the many consequences of gender-based violence until we recognize, acknowledge these facts, and adjust our language in the conversation. The statistics about shelter access are staggering. On a national level, a seven, uh, 2017 report from the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs shows that 13% of intimate partner violence survivors attempted to access shelter, but nearly half, 43%, were denied shelter. And a third of those were turned away based on gender identity. How does that translate into the numbers in New York City? As of 2018, the city had 2,689 emergency bed, uh, beds, and the HRA domestic violence system served nearly 10,000 individuals. If those 10,000 individuals represent 40% of gender-based violence survivors who are served, that means that there are over 20,000, 21,000 DV survivors attempting to access shelter in this city, and each year, roughly 9,000 survivors and their families are turned away, denied shelter. And according to our advocates, over 50 transgender nonconforming are turned away every year based solely on the fact of their gender identity. These numbers are clear. The TGNC community in New York is underserved. While all the beds in the HR system are available to cisgender individuals with families, there is no proportion of emergency beds specifically available to single TGNC survivors of gender-based violence. Additionally, the women-only atmosphere of domestic violence shelters discourages access by TGNC individuals. According to the Shelter Access Toolkit created by the Anti-Violence Project, a leader in the New York State LGBT Intimate Partner Violence Network, quote, many domestic violence programs in New York State often focus solely on heteronormative par paradigm of domestic violence, i.e. on men's violence against women, and they deny LGBTQ survivors full access to services, including safe shelter, because LGBTQ survivors do not meet the traditional understanding of who a survivor is, unquote. This is unacceptable. The goal of today's hearing is to ensure that HRA shelters are accessible and service all victims of gender-based violence, regardless of race, gender, or sexual orientation. NGBV must play a role in transforming the culture around services for survivors. Specifically, they must not only train domestic violence shelter staff repeatedly and often to ensure inclusivity, sensitivity, and cultural competence, but training alone, because training alone is not the solution, NGBV must use their expertise in auditing the work of domestic violence shelters and reviewing the domestic violence shelters' plans to comply with the state anti-discrimination policy published in 2015. In other words, not only train, but also audit to ensure compliance across the city. We look forward to learning about the services NGBV provides to victims of gender-based violence, both in and outside the HRA system and the working relationship, most importantly, between HRA and NGBV. My bill, intro 1712, is a vital step to help assess the needs of the TGNCNB survivors. It would require HRA to review the outreach efforts and services provided to NG, to TGNCNB individuals in domestic violence shelters, including any complaints that HRA has received. 
culturally competent services and training in effective and inclusive screening practices are critical for providing services. We can help ensure that our city's commitment to support all survivors becomes a reality for TGNCNB people. I look forward to your comments on my legislation. And parenthetically, I want to mention that it's our understanding of the entire domestic violence shelter system, only between four and eight beds are available to the TGNC population. Now, there are funding reasons why that is true, and that's reasonable. In other words, through TANF, the city is paid only by individual, not by unit, and by taking someone from the TGNC population, you are taking someone who will be an individual in what, and will be paid by, for as one person rather than two people which could fit in that unit. However, that cannot be the barrier that results in not accommodating the needs of the TGNC population out there. We are grateful to have HRA Chief of Special Services Annette Holm to testify, and Deputy Commissioner Natasha Godby, and Elizabeth Think, Deputy Commissioner at NGBV to testify, and Jennifer DeCarly, Assistant Commissioner for Family Justice Centers, I think that's in the Q&A, and many advocacy organizations that are here to testify. These are the experts on the complexity of domestic violence who are steeped in the work of piecing together the intersectionality. Let me say that one more time, these are the experts on the complexity of domestic violence. Um, sorry. Uh, the intersectionality of race, gender, socioeconomic, sexual or orientation, and the power dynamics and efforts to end gender and domestic-based violence. And it's also important to note that given the sensitivity of this topic, we're not going to hear today from survivors, right? And so unfortunately, their voices, although they will be encapsulated by everyone talking, we're not going to hear their voices directly. And I think that's an important consideration to have in mind. I'd also like to thank Marisa Mock, my chief of staff, my former legislative director, Ned Terrace, as well as committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing and working on the legislation. Thank you to Jay Zuri Ganapathy, my counsel, Chloe Rivera, the legislative policy analyst, Monica Peppel, financial analyst, and Elizabeth Arts, uh, our community engagement staff. So thank you very much to that, and I turn it back to the chair. Okay, we'd like to uh, call uh, administration officials that will be testifying. Okay, um, I will ask Council's Committee to swear you in. If you can all raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? You may begin. Good morning, Chairperson Levin and Chairperson Rosenthal and members of the General Welfare and Women and Gender Equity Committees. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and offer updates on our efforts to provide assistance and support for survivors of domestic violence. My name is Annette Holm and I am the Chief Special Services Officer for HRA. I am joined by Natasha Godby, the newly appointed Deputy Commissioner for Emergency Intervention Services, who began on April 1st of this year. As you know, next month is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and HRA welcomes the opportunity to inform our staff 
and providers about current issues related to domestic violence. This year, we will focus our efforts on client-centered decision-making and self-care training for staff who are exposed to the secondary trauma related to those who provide services to domestic violence survivors. HRA is the nation's largest social services agency, assisting over three million New Yorkers annually through the administration of public assistance programs, including cash assistance, employment programs, food stamps, public health insurance, and other supports that help New Yorkers remain in the workforce. HRA also plays a role in the administration of housing programs such as supportive housing and services designed to assist individuals who are chronically homeless, coupled with HIV, AIDS, serious mental illness, and or are survivors of domestic violence, among others. Much of our work focuses on advancing one of this administration's chief priorities, reducing income equality and leveling the playing field for all New Yorkers. We know that domestic violence is unfortunately far too common and blind to one's socioeconomic status, immigration status, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Anyone, anywhere can fall victim to domestic violence. HRA addresses the scourge of domestic violence, a major driver of poverty and homelessness, by ensuring survivors and their families have access to a safe living environment and trauma-informed services, both within the shelter systems and as they transition back into communities. Operating under the New York State Domestic Violence Prevention Act of 1987, the New York City Human Resources Administration works with a network of providers to provide support services for survivors of domestic violence and their children. The law requires counties to provide shelter and services to survivors of domestic violence and establishes funding for these programs. The New York State Office of Children and Family Services promulgates and maintains regulations for licensure and the standards for the establishment and maintenance of residential and non-residential domestic violence programs. OCFS authorizes HRA to administer the financial and contractual requirements of domestic violence emergency residential service programs. The New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance authorizes HRA to, admin to administer the financial and contractual requirements of the domestic violence tier two system. HRA administers the largest domestic violence shelter system in the country. The emergency domestic violence shelter system consists of 55 confidential facilities throughout all five boroughs. There are 2,514 emergency beds. The emergency beds provide trauma-informed shelter services to domestic violence survivors who are in immediate risk. Included in the 55 sites are nine DV Tier 2 transitional shelter facilities, which account for 362 units. Only domestic violence survivors who are stabilized in the emergency system can be transferred to the DV Tier 2 shelters. In fiscal year 19, the HRA domestic violence system served 10,983 individuals, which included 355 single adults and 3,877 families. In September 2015, Mayor de Blasio announced that the city would develop 400 additional DV Tier 2 units and 300 emergency beds, an unprecedented addition by the city to address capacity in the domestic violence shelter system. All 300 emergency beds have been awarded. An emergency domestic violence shelter, which was constructed primarily to accept households with pets, opened last week, and we are actively working to fill the beds. Additionally, 295 of the 400 Tier 2 units have been awarded. Three Tier 2 shelters are currently scheduled to open in 2020. 
For the remaining 105 tier two units, there is currently an open RFP and we strongly encourage providers to submit proposals. Emergency shelter services are designed to address domestic violence survivors who are in imminent danger and in need of safe housing. Programs are client-centered with a focus on managing the crisis and trauma of domestic violence, strengthening coping skills and enhancing client self-sufficiency. Services shall include individual counseling, advocacy, psychoeducational groups, and trauma-focused interventions that address the dynamics of domestic violence. All shelter programs may include on-site or have linkages to child care services, housing assistance, benefit entitlement assistance, financial development service, and economic empowerment programs to maximize self-efficiency. Enhanced services which may be available include expressive therapies, art, play, recreational, stress reduction, coping skill techniques, mental health, substance use counseling, and linkages to community-based medical providers. DV shelter providers offer an array of services to children, including but not limited to individual counseling for children. HRA conducts monthly meetings with DV shelter providers, the purpose of which is to discuss programmatic developments, share best practices, and address matters related to shelter operations. This year, in collaboration with the DV Provider Coalition, HRA hosted three DV residential best practice forums. The latest one focused on child welfare services and policies. Previous forums included trauma-informed care for children and presentations by the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence, the Administration for Children's Services, and Autism Speaks. Over the course of the past six years, this administration has advanced substantial policy changes that have had both immediate and long-term positive outcomes for domestic violence survivors accessing residential and or non-residential services. I'd like, I'd like to take some time to highlight numerous developments that have been made to assist domestic violence survivors improve their shelter ex experience and assist them in transitioning out of shelter and back into the community. Interagency collaboration. HRA in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the New York City Administration for Children's Services received grant funding to transform 15 domestic violence shelters in New York City over three years. The initiative will engage survivors and staff to enhance environments in the shelters, promoting wellness and supporting the social and emotional needs of survivors and their children. Language access services. DSS offers to share at no cost telephonic interpretation and ASL interpretation services with all DV shelter providers. This helps ensure that all DV survivors have access to shelter and support in their languages. New York City Well. HRA continues to explore ways in which it can strengthen the provision of trauma-informed mental health services within the domestic violence programs, recognizing the importance of having access to mental health support outside of providers' regular business hours. HRA delivered over 5,000 posters, flyers, and informationals to providers about services provided by New York City Well, a signature program funded through Thrive NYC. The posters are prominently displayed throughout the facility so that clients have a connection to free, confidential mental health support. New York City Well enables callers the ability to speak with a counselor via phone, text, or chat, and get access to mental health and substance use services in more than 200 languages, 24-7, 365 days a year. HRA collab collaborates with NGBV to ensure that all domestic violence providers 
are aware of training opportunities for staff, as well as services offered to survivors at the NYC Family Justice Centers and in communities across the city. These services can enhance what is offered by shelter providers to inform a more robust service package to survivors. School busing. HRA and the Department of Education collaborated to ensure that HRA shelter residents and their children are safely placed in schools and have resources to meet their educational needs. The school busing program upholds confidentiality and safety by not conducting pickups and drop-offs in front of the facility, but at a nearby location. We conduct presentations at ACS borough offices to inform staff of DV shelter rules and regulations. HRA partners with ACS to address complex case matters and assist with shelter needs. This July, we received a donation of 100 free cell phones for DV clients provided by the DSS Emergency Management Office. This donation benefited survivors whose communication devices were linked to their abusers and can now have a safe means of communication. Gender Equity Initiative. I'd like to take an opportunity to specifically highlight our work on gender equity. Historically, domestic violence services were created with cis women and heteronormative families in mind. Cisgender men, transgender, and gender nonconforming people accessing domestic violence services may encounter obstacles related to shelter placement. The DSS Diversity and Equity Team's Gender Equity Initiative engage HRA's non-residential domestic violence providers in their interests in becoming more welcoming and inclusive spaces for people of all genders. In 2017, trainings were offered to increase knowledge around gender inequity and provide affirming and welcoming engagements for survivors of domestic violence. Subsequently, outreach was made to the providers to provide them with the services needed to, I am sorry, excuse me, yeah, to identify gaps. We were encouraged by, this, by the providers' interests and measures taken to have LGBTQI and, not, and gender nonconforming clients feel welcome, accepted, and treated with respect and dignity. We continue to support their efforts to improve services to these clients in need of DV services. Our next engagement phase will include training, technical assistance, and surveying HRA's residential domestic violence providers in the coming months. As clients transition back into communities, it is essential to utilize programs and services designed to support and assist DV clients, particularly through the New York City Family Justice Centers and community-based services. These services include crisis intervention, case management, and advocacy, counseling, support groups, housing advocacy, and economic security. HRA contracts with nine providers to offer state-mandated non-residential services through the five boroughs. The goal of this program is to provide a range of supportive services to families of domestic violence. In addition to offering a series of core level services required by New York State regulations, and these include telephone hotline assistance, information and referral services, advocacy, counseling, community education, and outreach activities. These providers offer aftercare services for clients transitioning out of shelter to ensure that when they enter permanent housing, they are safe, financially secure, and on track for employment. In FY19, the non-residential service providers served on average 2016 clients. Other non-residential services include legal advocacy 
and assistance in obtaining orders of protection, securing U visas, and navigating divorce and child support proceedings, as well as services for adolescent and child witnesses of domestic violence. We recognize that oftentimes clients wish to receive services outside of their residence or even the broader community. It is our goal to ensure that clients are aware of the client-centered service options available to them throughout New York City and are able to access the services of interest to them through referrals and direct linkages to providers in the broader community, such as the Family Justice Centers located in every borough. Through its Office of Civil Justice, HRA oversees, manages, and monitors the city's programs that provide civil legal assistance to New Yorkers in need. Since 2014, the city has made great strides in increasing, enhancing, and making more efficient the delivery of civil legal services to low-income New Yorkers facing legal issues that may jeopardize the essentials of life, including things like housing and immigration status. Intro 1712 would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to reporting on the services provided to transgender and gender non-conforming individuals in domestic violence shelters. We look forward to working with the sponsor to ensure that all clients are treated with dignity and respect. As drafted, we have some concerns, namely about ensuring that collection of such information about transgender and non-binary people does not create barriers to access, raise privacy concerns, and or further traumatize a client in an already vulnerable situation. We look forward to better understanding the purpose of the data collection, for example, an interest in the number of transgender non-conforming people accessing DV service or about service provision and or specialized domestic violence services for transgender non-conforming people. There may be alternative means to meet our shared interest in ensuring gender-affirming services for transgender and non-binary people accessing our DV shelters. Intro 152 would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the Department of Homeless Services to report on families with children in shelter. We look forward to working with the sponsor to better understand the intention and goal of such reporting. I'd like to remind the committee that clients in domestic violence shelters are subject to strict confidentiality requ requirements and as written would require client consent for the collection and exact use of the data for this reporting purpose. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Officer Holmes. I, I appreciate uh, your testimony and I'm, I'm going to interrupt for the moment because we do have a survivor that is uh, here to testify. So. For the time being, and then we'll 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 bring the panel back. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, uh, would the individual like to come up to testify? Individuals. individuals. You don't have to. Uh, Right up here, and no need for names. No need for names. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, sorry, just make sure the red light is on. Uh, push the button. Oh. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Alida Chikambu, and I'm a survivor leader for Sanctuary for Families which is New York State's largest comprehensive service provider exclusively for survivors of domestic violence and trafficking. We are so grateful to the Committee of Women and Gender Equity and Chairs Council Member, Ms. Rosenthal, and the Committee on General Welfare, Mr. Stephen Levin, and for the opportunities really to speak today. 
We greatly appreciate the Council's concern about the efficiency of HIV domestic violence shelter system. As a former resident of for Sanctuary and Family Shelter, I cannot express enough the importance of such facilities. Operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days a year. I came to New York City three years ago with my three little girls, completely broken and barely alive. After a couple nights in a scary old motel, being admitted at, domestic, at the domestic violence shelter was the best thing that could have happened to me. I've never been in a shelter before, but surprisingly, this place really defeated all the stigma I had of a homeless shelter. The DV shelter was really the best thing that, that happened to me since I started my journey for running away from my abuser. I really liked it there. The staff was really properly trained to deal with DV survivors. I was happy in that one bedroom apartment. And I even remember sharing to my, um, my friend next door how blessed we were to be in such shelters because they had exchanged with other survivors with, or other um, people living in the shelters and it was not the same thing. But suddenly after three months, things changed. The minute I received my city voucher, um, I really right away felt the pressure. The pressure was that I had to move on. So I was really urged immediately to move out of the shelter. I couldn't stay past six months. I had just started to feel better. I was transitioning from heavy medication to medium intake. And remember that I'm new to New York City. So I didn't know how difficult, I'd rather say impossible, it was to find an apartment in three months. I had for record four notebooks that I used as apartment search log, a Ziploc full of business cards that I have from realtors, and a folder in my in inbox, in my email, that I really called apartment search with 650 emails. So I don't know if you can imagine 650 emails standing between you and finding an apartment for you and your, your children. The apartment search was so difficult because landlords were really skeptical. They didn't really want to deal with vouchers. Uh, many times they would hang up on me the minute I mentioned that I had one, and they would refuse to even have me go and look, and look at the apartment. The other issue that I also had was the fact that the amount that was given to, for those shelters were really not barely enough. Um, six, 1500 what was in my case, was a lot because that was the price of the mortgage that I paid living in Maryland. So I had no idea with the reality here in New York City. I looked for an apartment day and night, but it didn't happen. And I remember the housing specialist in charge of helping me had said that it was not my fault which was really important for me to hear because many times my abuser always set me up for failure and made me feel like it was my fault. And looking this apartment search adventure was put me back in that same track. Unfortunately, when I had to go back to PATH after six months at the DV shelter, and unfortunately for me, all the DV shelters were full. So the only option that I had was for me to go back to a regular shelter. At that time, it was, that was really the nightmare because I, I wonder why and how this could have happened, how people didn't care what would have happened to me in a regular shelter for me and my children. And the only answer that I had at that time was just that the system had failed me. What I really want to emphasize here is the fact that six months is not enough. It's definitely not enough to expect for a survivor, for, uh, for someone, to get well and move on. And based on my experience here, I see three problems. The first is the fact that, like I said, six months, not, six months, three months, I'm sorry, six months is not enough. If we're gonna build shelters to help those survivors, we need to give them at least one year. One year sounds really something that doable. The second problem I see here is the fact that those city vouchers need to be increased. It's really not, it, it, it doesn't really match the reality. Lastly, it seems like the system works against survivors, especially for single women with dependent minor children. 
by forcing them to go back into the cycle of lifetime public assistance. Just to cite a few examples, um, PA cases were really mistakenly closed, putting really families at risk of eviction, which is the situation I'm, going right, I'm living right now. And exiting those shelters with um, improper preparation is really at risk because when, we, when you are placed, let's say in my case, in a shelter which is not trauma-based or focused, this just delays your way of getting, getting better and getting back on track. HRA has been good at providing appropriate and safe sites to survivors. Like I mentioned earlier, getting into a DV shelter was the best thing that really happened to me at that time. But we still have a challenge is to assure that this solution are really efficient. That's why we recommend that the city builds more affordable apartment housing with survivors of domestic violence at the top priority of occupying those uh, facilities. We also suggest that the city elaborate and implement trauma-focused strategies to accompany survivors exiting shelters. Finally, we need to strengthen the city's effort to prosecute landlords who illegally refuse to take those rental assistance. I thank you so much for your support and for supporting New York City's survivors and the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so, thank you so much. I, I, um, is it okay if I ask a question? Sure. Um, so thank you so much for, for testifying and for telling, um, telling your story and for, um, and for providing clear, actionable items for the city to, to, to take. And, um, and I think that those are all things that we can do and we must do. And I think that it's important that we listen to you and to other survivors and others that are experiencing um, uh, what you've experienced and listen to you. And, and so we, we hear you and, and, um, and we, we'll, we will be working with you. Thank you. Um, can I, I, I want to ask sure. about throughout all of the steps in this process, whether it was the DV um, shelter or whether it was uh, when had you had to go back into a, a DHS shelter, did you feel that you had access to adequate, uh, like a, a therapist of any kind to help deal with the trauma of, of being a survivor? Um, did, they, did they provide a, a licensed clinical social worker or psychologist that's available? Definitely. When living at the shelter, I had all type of supports, it, not only for myself, even for my children. So we really, I really, we really felt that we were being helped. We were taken into consideration. So we, I had about three um, staff, clinical staff working with me, and uh, they were accessible all the time. And then even the staff in the shelter, they were really trained. They knew how to handle any situation what happened with me and my children, even with other families also. Mm -hmm. But the minute I left that, that facility, it, it was something else. People, I, like I said, I felt like the system had felt me because they, they didn't care. It was just, she had a place where to stay with her children and that was it. That was, for them, they were doing a lot, like mm -hmm. putting me in a place. Everything else that, was, that I needed at that time, no one really cared. I didn't have any type of assistance. Were you ever able to find an apartment through the city FEPS voucher? I, I, I did later on, but it was really difficult because like, like I'm saying, it, yeah. it's so funny because sometimes you are almost pushed to lie. Many times I was pushed to lie. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's not the reality. It's either you have to come up with the, the supplement mm -hmm. because there is no, there's right. no apartment for family for $59. And what, and what was the voucher amount limit? What 15, was 15. 15, 15 for a two or three bedroom? Uh, yeah, two, two bedrooms. Two bedrooms, and, um, 15, 15. And I'm still struggling right now. It's just, like I said, it's like a cycle. Right, you and they don't allow like for you to stop. I mean, it's, they, they, that's the way that it's structured. And this is something that we're, we're working on. Mm -hmm. I've, we're, we're, I, I, I hear you 100% because a two bedroom for 15, 15, anywhere in New York City, on top of the discrimination that landlords are, are, are doing around um, against vouchers, 
um, makes it uh, virtually impossible. So even with a housing specialist. Definitely. Um, now, was your housing specialist helpful? She was great. She, she, she really, she was helping me. And also the fact that is, I don't think there is enough. I, I don't know how it works, um, but I really wish that we had more at the, at the, at the shelter. Or in, more housing specialists. Yes, yeah. so they could help assist everybody properly. Yeah. So the, the burden is, all, is really, when you're going through a tough situation, you don't want to put, they don't want to, you don't want to be put in a situation where they, they make you feel like you're guilty. It, it, because as I say, her telling me that it was not my fault was really important because she saw me, how I worked day and night. But she couldn't be with me 24 hours yeah. because there were other families she had to assist. Yeah. And really the burden has to be put on, on the agency, not on the survivors. It's not fair. And when you left the, the DV shelter, did you feel that you had in terms of like the mental health support or you know the, just the, the 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 you know connecting with the therapist were you able to maintain that type of connection not not right away because yeah. think about it for me it was i had to i had to feel safe i was not safe out there i had to feel safe so my routine was really to if i could not go outside. I would not go outside. Stay somewhere with my little girls. I had to protect them. So at that time, you put yourself, you forget about yourself. You right. forget about getting, getting well. You have to survive. You don't want to go back in the same situation. Right. And I'm a two-time survivor, so that was just, you know, it cannot happen anymore. So, yo, I forgot about me. I forgot about getting well. I knew um, they, they will suggest some places out there to, in the community to go and get help. But it's not the same thing. You don't have the same connection. You go there, you don't have the same feeling that those people are out there for you. Right. Living in a shelter, I had that connection. But out on, there, it was not the same thing. On the facilities, yes. Were you able, did you do any accessing the, um, like either the calling or the texting? There's a, the, you know, the, the, the administration testified about the, you know, the, the put up the posters about you have access to and you know the NYC well. You know, you, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you just repeat again? Um, that I guess I'm not sure if it was there at the time, but the, um, through the Thrive Initiative, the overall mm -hmm. um, city's mental health initiative that uh, First Lady Shirley McRae is heading up, that there's they, um, survivors have access. You could call a therapist basically or text a therapist. Again, um, when you be uh, when you've been the victim and especially domestic violence, you, you don't just talk to anybody and you, it's really even difficult to talk. Mm -hmm. So um, building, when you build a relationship with somebody in the long term or somebody you feel like really comfortable talking the person that understands you, yeah. it's not like I'm calling 311 and asking where I can get rid of my TV. It's not right. the same thing. Right. Um, it's not like this is not a good initiative, but it really depends, you know, in the trauma, how affected you are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, special, special so, so in the, the trust, the relationship, yeah, the specialty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and if, the I mean, access. I'm sorry, it was easier for me to go back to the agency and contact the agency somehow just to continue that help than right. to sell something new. Right. Right, right. There's, I mean, access is an important. I mean, I, I could tell you for, in my case, I, I go to therapy, and my therapist is on the is at Gra near Grand Central, and so for me to get there from here is only you know two subway stops, and I, it's able I'm able to make it work because of, <laughs> but but, but, yeah. but if it's if it was somewhere you know in Queens, it would take the whole day, and well, it makes it very difficult. Definitely. So I think it's it's important to have the access, the relationship, the trust, the relationship, the specialization. Trust, definitely, yes. Um, how are your how are your children now? They're great. They they're really happy, full of life. She's laughing because they're really well known at the daycare center. Mm -hmm. They 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 they're great. I mean they they're doing good. Excellent. I'm re I'm really happy that actually even for them that they really had the support um, as early in that age because my concern was just the the three young girls. So I didn't want them to have that memory of what mommy went through as um, something normal, something standard, and not talk about it, and wake up one day and just say, hey, this is what's happening to me, and 
I, it, that was really a concern uh, to me. The, but the fact that they could, and we are, we are with people who really pay attention to what they say, um, the way they, they, they act. Um, like I said, having a, a trained staff is really important, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for your testimony. And for You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your coming forward and sharing this information. I'm glad to see you here today. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Um, I want to get at the idea. It sounds like you had a great experience at the DV shelter. Definitely in the beginning, yes. And that's so helpful to hear. Um, wondering a couple of specifics. When you had um, bad experiences where uh, landlords denied you an opportunity to provide your voucher, were you able to share that information with the housing specialist? Oh, yes, definitely. Then I, report right that away. back. Mm -hmm. I even, uh, many, many, I think two instances, I even called 311 to report. Great. Great. And then um, with your therapist, it sounds like you developed a great relationship with your therapist at the DV the shelter, shelter, but then what happened when you left the DV shelter, you just didn't have access to that person anymore? It's not like I didn't have access to that person. Okay. Um, like I mentioned, and it's, it's just proximity, accessibility. Got it. It, it was not the same thing. But you could have gone back. Oh, I did. And you did. I, I did. When I put my, I was myself in a situation where I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. I knew where to get the help, so I did. I did yeah. call. I did call. Okay. Even the staff. I mean, my therapist and other staff also. Um, and they were available. I did call to you? because we had a lot of social events um, that really involved the family, and then um, the girls loved it, and I loved it. So I was, in a way, getting, you know, a sense of real life. So even those staff, I, I, I did call them when I needed them. Okay, and that's after you left the six. That's, the that six was months. after I left, yes. And did you um, ever visit a family justice center? If I have been, I've been there, yes. The family justice center? To the one in the Bronx, I believe. I the one in the Bronx. Time, yeah. And how often did you go there? To one what? time. What? Just one time. Just one time. I just, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to try just to give you a, a picture. Um, you've been in a relationship for 20, 30 years of, um, so of hiding because you cannot talk, you cannot say certain things. So even when you are out of that relationship, connecting easily to new people, connecting to new people is not easy. Going to some place new, it's not easy. It, it's still, it's almost kind of scary. Um, the fact that I liked about having all these services at the shelter, I didn't have to go anywhere. I remember even when I didn't feel like going out, because part of the process was for me to be out because getting into public transportation was an issue for me because I saw my abuser everywhere, all these issues. So it was therapeutic for me sometimes to go outside. But even when I couldn't do it, my therapist would come to the shelter. And now I didn't have that anymore. So I had to go get the help, but like I said, you in the beginning I had to choose what was what was important. Taking care of me at that time was not important. What's the right length of time to stay in a DV shelter? I think a year, and then a year, and from the beginning, just to explain everything to 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 to, to the client. Like I said, I. New York City was new to me. I had no idea that, you know, finding an apartment was a full-time job. I didn't know that. Thank you. Oh. I'm, no, I, I can't go on. It's up to you. I'm just. That's okay. Thank you. I just you. wanted to say that you, 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 from yes. the beginning, it's really important to explain the situation. Clearly tell the truth. New York City is expensive. The housing policy is really complex. Um, it might happen that you find an apartment in three months, six months. Sometimes it takes a year or two. Um, we can help you for one year maximum. Then we have to see, you know, if you can go to a chair too. Um, one of the person you mentioned it. And it's it, it just, but not six months. It's just. Thank you. And lastly, 
Um, I really was taken by your point of um, it feels like the system, larger system, um, doesn't fundamentally help someone get out of poverty. Uh, you make this point about uh, a cycle of a lifetime of public assistance, and you noted that um, the public assistance cases are mistakenly closed. Do you know how that ever gets resolved or what I have no it? idea up to today. I don't even understand what happened. And like I said, I'm still in that situation. I, I don't know because you get moved from one bow to another. There is no consistency. I don't know. I mean, they, they put the burden on you. I'm not HRA. <laughs> you have the system. Right. And I would think in 2019, with everything that we know about computer, things will make sense. So but this is a true, uh, uh, something that's happened to you in 2019? No, no, I'm saying even, even now, even, even now things are the same. From one barrel to another, they close your case. You don't get the proper, um, the proper mail explaining to you what really happened, what's the next step. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. You're coming today. I'm sure you had to set aside other things to do that. Thank you. So thank you. Chair, I'm sorry, could I ask one question? Uh, thank you so much for, for being here and for the courage to tell your story and for uh, sharing all that experience with us. Um, so I want to, I, I think your point about extending to a year is a very good one, but I also want to understand the, the transition point. Um, so if you could just say a little more about um, uh, going to PATH, one other thing I don't understand here is why it's necessary, you know, maybe at the end of a year you, you, you wouldn't have found a place. At some point, some people might have to, tran you know, to, to transition to the tier twos. But I, and I'm going to ask HRA this as well, why that can't be a seamless transition that was arranged from the sanctuary shelter instead of having to go back to PATH and then get placed elsewhere in the system. So I, that's just one piece of this that has not made a lot of sense to me. And, um, I received, I think it was, um, I never received a, 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 a mail, but I did receive, I had a message in the, at the office when I, one day um, that I had to call um, a shelter. Um, that was the second option that I was transitioning to. Um, I didn't know that there were a delay. Um, and then transitioning to that shelter, I think it was not automatic either. I think you had to go through, um, you know, ask your questions and, you know, find out if you were fit um, and things like that. So when I called, um, the person I spoke to um, said that, you know, they wish I had called like a day before, or two days before, and then they were supposed to contact me back to see if I was supposed to go back to their places or not. So it, it was just like, it was not 100% sure that I was getting there. And, and just so I understand, because at, at Sanctuary, you know, you had a housing specialist you're working with. Mm -hmm. You had a set of people who knew your situation, who knew your story, who had been working with you, who understood what your needs were, and who are contracted with HRA, mm -hmm. and, and who already had all this information. And then you still had to go back through the PATH system, talk to people who didn't really know you, your current because they system? Couldn't, I couldn't stay there longer. I couldn't stay at, 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 the, at the place longer than six months. And right. I didn't find the apartment at that time. So well, that all my, my only, I mean, and uh, look, I think both helping everybody find an apartment is the most important and extending from six to 12 months would be enormously valuable. But another thing that would make more sense to me here is that the folks you were working with at Sanctuary would have had the ability to, to directly connect you to the tier two shelter placement you were going to go to, rather than have to go back to PATH and get replaced in the, in the system, so. No, like I said, I had that option. I, I had the message, I had the phone call. I don't remember the place, but I, was, I, I, I did contact somebody from a shelter. Um, that was the, ex, uh, the tier two, it was a tier two shelter. Like I said, and the person had mentioned to me that I must have called, I should have called two days before that, and then um, that they were supposed to let me know okay. what was going to happen. Okay. Thank you, and thank you again for, for coming forward to help us understand the system better today from the perspective of somebody who has had to live it. We really appreciate it.
Thank you. I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by Ben Kalos from Manhattan and Mark Traeger from Brooklyn. Thank you again for coming. Um, okay, I think we're inviting the administration to come back up. Thank you so much for your patience in uh, taking the time to listen to somebody with lived experience. Okay, we'll move on now with NGBV. Yes? Okay. okay. Good morning, Chairpersons Rosenthal and Levin and members of the City Council Committees on Women and Gender Equity and General Welfare. I'm Elizabeth Dank, Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel at the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV, and I'm joined here by Assistant Commissioner Jennifer DeCarly, who oversees the Family Justice Centers and Outreach. And I'm pleased to be here today with our colleagues at HRA to speak about domestic violence, resources, and services. And I just want to take a minute, I know the survivor that just spoke has left the room, but I want to thank her for sharing her experience and being here with us today as well. The Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, which was relaunched and expanded in 2018 by Executive Order 36, develops policies and programs, provides training and prevention education, conducts research and evaluations, performs community outreach, and operates the five New York City Family Justice Centers. We collaborate with city agencies and community stakeholders to ensure access to inclusive services for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, including intimate partner and family violence, elder abuse, sexual violence, stalking, human trafficking, and other forms of gender-based violence. The FJCs are walk-in, multi-service centers in each borough for survivors to access free, confidential services and support. NGBV has an on-site administrative team at each FJC to oversee operations and coordination of all on-site partners and providers, which include community-based organizations that provide civil legal services, case management, counseling, and children's services, City agencies, including the Human Resource Administration, Health and Hospitals, the New York City Police Department, and the District Attorney's offices, and other providers that offer a wide array of supportive services. Through our partnership with the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, at every FJC, there are now on-site clinicians to provide mental health services and support for domestic violence and gender-based violence survivors and their families. Co-locating providers and agencies on-site at each FJC makes it easier for survivors to get help. FJCs welcome people of all incomes, ages, sexual orientations, and gender identities, regardless of the language they speak, their immigration status, or housing situation. FJC services and programs are available to all qualifying New Yorkers, including those in shelter, whether they are in domestic violence shelter or the broader homeless shelter system. Service delivery at the FJCs is consistent with trauma-informed, client-centered approaches to care. In calendar year 2019 through September 1st, the five family justice centers have served almost 18,000 unique clients through 43,000 client visits. During that time, over 1,300 clients received housing and shelter advocacy services, such as advocacy with shelter place placement and assistance applying for the permanent housing options available for DV survivors in the city. Of the 1,300 clients receiving housing and shelter advocacy services this year, almost 600 of them received assistance obtaining emergency shelter. <coughs> NGBV collaborates with city agencies and community partners to connect survivors with resources, including the comprehensive array of services available at the FJCs through community-based domestic violence programs and through other city programs. All New Yorkers, including those in domestic violence and homeless shelters may access these services. NGBV, including the FJCs, work closely with our colleagues and partners at the Department of Social Services to assist FJC clients seeking shelter or other housing assistance. We also collaborate with the city contracted shelter um, directors. We streamline referral processes to services and resources and discuss ways to enhance collaboration and support for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence entering the shelter systems. 
Additionally, on-site FJC providers provide advocacy and navigation assistance to support FJC clients with the domestic violence shelter intake process and or the homeless shelter intake process. NGBV and HRA are committed to enhancing partnerships between the FJCs and shelters, and we have worked closely with Thrive NYC to ensure shelter residents have access to on-site mental health services at the FJCs, which are implemented through health and hospital staff and include psychiatry and psychotherapy. The FJC mental health program has served approximately 340 unique clients so far in 2019. In addition to our collaboration through direct services for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, NGBV also works closely with DSS to provide relevant trainings and technical assistance to shelter staff and service providers. NGBV's training team has developed a cadre of trainings that range from Intimate Partner Violence 101 to more advanced trainings, including topics such as trauma-informed practices, risk assessment and safety planning, and IPV and the LGBTQ community, which are designed to equip direct service providers with best practices when working with survivors. Through our partnerships with HRA and DHS, we have trained over 5,300 agency employees and contracted staff who work with or may come in contact with people in the shelter system who are experiencing or have experienced domestic or gender-based violence. We have also partnered with DHS and HRA to provide ongoing monthly IPV 101 trainings and advanced trainings for their staff, specifically targeting new employees and contracted staff. During IPV 101 trainings, DHS and HRA representatives often deliver presentations on agency policies and procedures related to domestic and gender-based violence. NGBV works to provide comprehensive, accessible services for all New Yorkers experience domestic or gender-based violence. Our work extends from connecting survivors with direct, service, um, direct services to training service providers and city agency staff across the city to work with individuals in a trauma-informed way. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with our city agency colleagues, our community partners, and other stakeholders to better serve survivors, particularly those in shelter. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to these issues and we welcome any questions the committees may have. Thank you so much. I just, very quickly, I just want to acknowledge uh, we've been joined by fourth graders from Green Hill School in Brooklyn. Welcome, guys. <laughs> welcome to the New York City Council. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Okay. Um, Boy, do I really appreciate your testimony and all the information that you've shared today. It's obviously a complex issue and, and you're doing um, amazing work. And I really wanna thank HRA and NGBV, the administration, for what the challenges that you're trying to face and the, the people you're trying to help. It's, um, it's so important, so thank you for that. Um, I want to try to understand just a couple of things, if you could help me with this. Um, the first just very basic question is, how many, um, the state criteria, I want to first ask about uh, cisgender women and their experience um, coming to PATH. How many, um, and, and as my understanding is that you testify, there's certain criteria that have to be met in order for them to get into the crisis shelter. Um, how many women do you think are turned away because they don't meet the criteria? We don't have that number available. However, what I can say is that we make every effort to house women who apply for service and men and whoever comes to our agency in need of domestic um, violence shelter, we do make every attempt to house them. If at the time of assessment they are deemed eligible and we do not have a unit that's available at that time, we will continue to contact them within 60 to 90 day period just to see if they are still interested and when we have a unit, we'll link them up to that unit and if it's a good fit for the provider and the individual, the family, they will be accepted at that point. And so how many people fall into that category? We will have to get back to you with those numbers. That would be very helpful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. thank you for offering that. 
Um, and then similarly, how many people um, do you think are turned away because the provider doesn't feel it's a good fit to have that individual? I wouldn't necessarily couch it as the provider doesn't feel it's a good fit. Um, the DV system has great providers that have been doing this work for quite a number of years. Um, they are established providers. Basically, when they interview with a DV survivor, it's to ensure first and foremost for the safety of that individual and the family. So they're looking to make sure that where they're housed, it's a safe environment for them. In addition to that, will the family um, be amenable to receiving the services that are provided by the provider? So it's a fit to make sure that it's good for the family, the individual, and the provider, and it's safe. How many TGNC uh, identifying or, or not even people come forward every year? So that to ask is for not shelter? a criteria that we capture. We do know that we service them, and um, I know that when you spoke, you said that we didn't have um, units specifically for transgender, but we do. Um, maybe I missed that. That's okay. okay. I'm going to hear what you have to say. Okay. So what we do, we have single units in our system. Um, URI, one of our providers, a longstanding provider, recently just opened up a shelter that has a number of single units. How many in total? I'll have to get that number, get back to you. Wait, wait, that wait. Number. How many singles before URI and then just how many? Okay, so we do have singles before URI and we have singles with URI. So How many we'll, singles pre-URI? We'll get that number. I have to get that number for you. I don't have it off the top of my head. And then do you know the number in URI? Do we have that call in? We, yeah, but she's asking how many singles. I don't have that number, but I do know that they have a number of singles. We'll try to get that Is number. Is it over a dozen? It's about, oh, she's here. Hmm? 32? 32. 32 with URI. 32 is the total with Out URI. Out of 100 beds. So they have 100 beds in this new facility. Yes. Of the 100 beds, 32 are singles. And how many in the system? prior to That's her. the number I'll have to get back to you with. And do they um, accept TGNC individuals? We accept everyone who is a domestic violence survivor as long as it's a safe fit for the individual and that we can provide the services that are needed to them and they're willing to accept our services, we will accept them. Have they submitted a plan for how they work with TGNC individuals? So we work in collaboration with um, the Anti-Violence Project and the um, Mayor's Office to End Gender-Based Violence. We work collaboratively to provide training to all of our providers. Right, no, I'm just asking a specific thing. In 2015, the state required that every provider present a plan on how their, what their efforts will be around the LGBT community. And I'm just wondering, had they submitted their plan? I have to get back to you on that one. I don't have an answer for that right now. Um, URI is here with us. Oh, I'm sorry. That is part of the operational plan and it's submitted to the state. So you don't see it? We do receive it. So we receive the plans as well, but it's also submitted to the state as part of the operational plan. Have you ever reviewed a plan? me personally. Or your office, what are, what's the review process like? So whenever the plans are submitted, it comes into our agency, what it's done, it's a review of the plan, of the, the total operational yeah. plan, and then we forward it to the state. Do you ever respond to the plan, make comments? Absolutely. Do you, do you measure whether or not it meets the needs of the LGBT community? I can't speak specifically to the LBGTQI community mm -hmm. at this point right now, okay. but we do review the plan. And have those plans ever been reviewed by, are they sent to NGBB to review the plans? No, it is not. Okay, is there any reason you couldn't do that? Would it be possible to do that in the future in working together just so they could have a, their eyes on it with their sort of training? 
Yeah. At this point, we could explore it. I cannot answer okay. definitively, but we can explore it. Okay. I'd be really interested in knowing, like, is there some legal reason why they aren't? Mm -hmm. um, it, what impediment? Why wouldn't that be shared now? Mm -hmm. I mean, the relationship, NGBV has been working with HRA for at least a year, and I'm just wondering, what's the relationship like? You know, so that sort of gets at that question. Um, I want to ask specifically uh, about something a little different. Um, and this has to do with process. Mm -hmm. Survivors are asked to sign an HRA mandated form each morning by 10 a.m. for verification of the residential service provided and for reimbursement procedures for the provider. And I understand that, you know, the state has regulations, federal government. A survivor who works overnight or has other uh, extenuating circumstances sometimes makes it sometimes makes this documentation verification challenging. And then, of course, that leads to reimbursement delays um, and, and you know problems by the staff, all totally understandable. Do you know where the regulation comes from and how HRA can ensure providers are correctly reimbursed without a daily requirement of the survivor? Could there be flexibility given as to the timing of the intake form? And also I'm wondering if there could be a possibility of electronic system. Well, funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> we have moved to, to an electronic system. We are in the process of rolling it out. And we make every effort to work with our um, DV survivors who are sheltered for those who work overnight, for those who have alternate schedules to ensure that the attendance can be accounted for. We work with the providers as well. So with this new electronic system that we have for attendance, the individual can either use the phone in the shelter where they can account for their attendance, but if that's unavailable, the shelter provider can also account for their attendance. So under this new system that we are rolling out, it's rolled out to a uh, a first phase of it and we're getting ready to move to the next phase, all of the providers eventually will be in the system. What's the timing? Call it. For all the providers, when will it be done? We are saying approximately six months. In six months? Yes. And how many shelters is it in now? Seven. It's in seven of the 45? Yes, we were trying to, seven of the 54, 55, I'm sorry, seven of okay. the 55. Um, the first phase, we were working out the glitches, and we are piloted with these seven shelters, and we used a variety of our shelters, and now that we've worked that out, we'll be moving it to the, um, to the rest of them. In your testimony, you mentioned that you got a donation of 100 cell phones for um, survivors. I'm wondering what the demand is for cell phones, and why this needed to happen through a donation, why you wouldn't have the funds to give survivors cell phones now? So we were fortunate that there was some phones that were left over from a program that no longer needed them and they was trying to find out a program that could use them and they offered it to us and we gladly accepted it. And we found that it has been beneficial. It would be something we would need to seek funding for if we would like to continue. So 100 individuals can use the cell phones now Yes. And, um, and I imagine they give back the cell phone after their stay in the shelter? No, they would be able They're to able keep to keep it. Phone. So that 100 yes. is gone. And how, yes. many, how many adults are in the DV shelter system right now? Uh, currently for 2019, FY19, 10,833 individuals were served. 
the number of children served in the emergency was 5,550. Is 5,000 a subset of that 10,000 number? Yes. Right. So you have about approximately 5,000 adults, mm -hmm. yes. and you've already given away your 100 cell phones. Yes. So you have a demand for roughly maybe 4,900 more. Is there any expectation of additional phones? Is this something that you think is important or necessary? Well, just and specifically, I was thinking of it in the context of the question I even just asked, mm -hmm. right? How to make contact, mm -hmm. to even say that you're checking in. Just to clarify, not everyone actually needs a replacement phone. It was, sure. It's just What's the demand? That well, right now we don't know the demand because we only had the 100 phones and that's what's the donation. Could it be but added as part of an intake question when somebody comes into a shelter, just part of the regular intake? Do you have kids? Do you have a cell phone? It is something we can explore. Uh huh. I think it'd be interesting to know what the demand is. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit more about non-payment provider issues. Um, providers encounter non-payment issues when residents stay out of shelter because of medical issues with their children or other family members. HRA requests letters from the hospital documenting the resident's presence in the hospital, i.e. staying overnight with a minor child in the hospital or at a family member's home and not being physically present at the shelter. If the medical incident occurs when a social worker is not present, the resident can experience difficulties in getting documentation of their physical president presence at the hospital or their location. If the provider does not have a letter, they may not be reimbursed, even when the resident submits the patient billing information. Issues like these happen with some frequency and can create a serious financial shortage for the provider, especially over a large number of beds. Providers can also enter difficult power dynamics of the provider-client relationship in trying to find such documentation rather than working on the well-being of the survivor and their future. And this is something I was the chair of the Committee on Contracts. This is a tug that is kind of natural, always happens, but I'm just wondering um, how you've thought about being flexible in these situations or is the state and the federal government, to have they totally constrained your abilities here or can you find flexibility? So we do work with providers and we try to get as much documentation as we can to account for the attendance. As per the regulations, you have to be in the bed or account for your absence in order for the provider to be paid. Of we course, are, I mean, that's yes. the premise of the and, question. Yeah, and so it's a state regulation? Yes, yes it is. Right, so given that mm -hmm. challenge and the reality of a DV survivor, what has HRA done to work with the providers? Because this is something we're hearing from multiple providers. Yes, I mean, we hear it as well, and we are working with the providers. We're trying to come up with every avenue that we can to um, account for payments to providers in the event of an absence that is undocumented. So we are definitely working with them. And just to clarify, it is also a federal claiming issue in addition to the state regulations. Hmm. Um, sorry, I'm just hearing my colleagues have questions. So I'm gonna ask one more just quick one to mm -hmm. to my colleagues and then we'll come back. Um, there are providers who are very, um, who are not big and might be relatively new, but are very um, culturally competent, but are small providers, small-ish, and may not currently be in the HRA system. What's the opportunity for a provider like that to get a contract with the city? So we do have an open RFP right now for tier two. Um, we have 125 beds that are still available, and we encourage anyone to um, apply. The, it's on Accelerator, and there are requirements with Accelerator in regards to, you know, what constitutes a provider, but we welcome applications. Sorry, how about the crisis center? I'm sorry, 105 beds that are still. 
that are still open on the R. 105 for yes. Tier 2. Yes. And any for crisis? Excuse me? For emergency shelter. No, this is, this is for Tier 2. And is there an opportunity coming up, do you think, for the crisis shelter beds? For the emergency beds? Yeah, sorry, emergency beds. So at this particular point right now, we're just um, opening up the last of the 300. So we will assess and look at our system. We're filling those beds right now, and then we'll see um, as we move along and we complete the RFP for the 400 units to see what the need is at that particular point. So in time. I guess what I'm saying is this. Their provider is doing the service now with no government funding. So the demand is there, right? These are individuals who cannot stay in their home. Mm -hmm. The demand is there. And what I'm asking is, what's the opportunity for those providers to get government funding? And the answer is they have to apply through a contract process, through the RFP, and um, and meet the criteria of the that's in Accelerator, which I'm really familiar with. So I guess what I wanted to hear, <laughs> what I was hoping you would say, even though you're a big bureaucracy and I get that, is that is there room for culturally c competent smaller providers that are not the big sanctuary families that has been doing this forever and really knows you know, the system and how to work it. Is there any opportunity for a culturally competent provider doing it now, has been doing it for the last five years, doesn't really know about acceler that Accelerator exists, how do they go about and how would they know? How, how can government lend them a hand, helping hand to to get some government funding? So we do welcome culturally competent providers. We embrace that. And if at this particular point, if a provider, generally what happens if providers are interested in applying, they will reach out to the program, which would be the domestic ODV, Office of Domestic Violence, and they can at least provide them with the information as to what is needed for them to apply. Is this information available at the family justice centers so that a provider, how would a provider know? I mean, people don't magically reach out to government. Do you know what I mean? I say that respectfully, but you know, for normal, I mean, for other people's lives, just sort of running a shelter, you don't necessarily know how to do it. So I'm just wondering, how would they even know? Um, no, we don't generally have the solicitation information available at the Family Justice Centers, but through the competitive procurement process, all of the notifications are um, sent out through that process and available. To right, although you have to be in the system already when, uh, when that thing is sent out. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, we do, um, we are happy to talk to providers about the system and about competitive procurements and um, provide information about how to become registered. Absolutely. How many in the last year do you think you've worked with who are not part of the system, who are small, culturally competent, but small, not sophisticated enough necessarily to get a city contract? How many do you think you work with? I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, we, I'd have to look to see what solicitations we had recent re recently released and what providers ended up getting those contracts. Well, I guess I sort of mean, at the FJCs, this is for your colleague, I think, <coughs> Do you hear from culturally competent providers who don't know how to, who say we want to provide service, we want, we need government funding? We do, we do, yes. We do often um, meet with our uh, contracted providers as well as our in-kind providers. We meet regularly and we let them know about solicitations that may be out, not only for domestic violence shelter, but also maybe for FJC services or other contracts that we're aware of. So recently in the New York Times, there was an article about Asia Women's Center. Are you familiar with mm -hmm. them? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I saw the article. I am familiar with them. Yeah. We actually work with a large number of culturally specific providers at the FJCs, yeah. um, such as Arab American Family Support Center, Womankind, Garden of Hope, and those are not no, no, agencies no. that have city contracts. Um, so Do they have shelter beds? 
No, the ones that so I just... So Asia has shelter beds. Yep, and I do know that, actually. Um, Garden of Hope has shelter beds, and they're on site at some of our centers. Um, Garden of Hope, they are a culturally specific provider in Queens and in Brooklyn. Um, but I These are all providers that have beds. Yep, they have beds. The and so why can't they get government funding? So I think that's a bigger question um, about making sure people are aware when there are solicitations out there and also providing capacity building and support um, to make sure people know about Accelerator and know about all the requirements that you need to be able how, to How can that happen? Um, I think that's something we should take back and think about because I think it's a great suggestion to provide that capacity building. And I would love to talk to the organization because even if they're not able to provide shelter beds, we could partner with them through the Family Justice Centers um, to make sure that we're connecting with them. Right, but I mean everything, okay, I'll I let that go. I and mean, we know that's all on a quote unquote volunteer basis yes. when we In connect. Fact. When FJC's partner, that mm -hmm. means the partnering nonprofit does this work for free. Mm -hmm. Yes, right, there's kind. no yep. funding from the Family Justice Center. Um, right at the moment, we don't have RFPs out for core services, but we, we're hoping to uh, release those soon. I can, Liz can speak How long that. have you worked with us here? Say it again, excuse how, me? How long have you worked with them? Worked with which agency? Sorry. Uh, Athea. We don't work specifically with them on site at the FJCs yet, so I was saying that I would love to uh, meet with them and talk about ways that we could partner. So you've never met with them before? No, I haven't met with them. We work with other culturally specific providers at the centers. Okay, because um, that was a pretty big article in the Times. Yeah. I would have thought the city would have reached out to them. It was a pretty big deal I saw in my mind's eye. Yeah. Anyway, okay, I'm going to turn it over mm -hmm. to colleagues. Council Member, which one is first? Uh, uh, Gredenchek and then Council Member Lander. Thank you, uh, Chairs. Um, I just want to, uh, I want to ask you this question. It's been a, a, over an hour, I guess, since you testified, but um, the shelters themselves, are any of them run by HRA or they are all run by providers? And There are two shelters, New Day 1 and New Day 2, that are direct run HRA shelters, and we are in the process right now of contracting out those two shelters. Um, and to follow up on Chair Rosenthal's um, questioning about culturally competent um, uh, services for DV victims, and uh, to me that's extremely important. I, I think most of my colleagues represent uh, very diverse districts. I just want to know um, how you would go about that. How would a provider, is there some liaison at, uh, who's the, the entry point into HRA for that? Are we talking about a shelter? Running a shelter, yeah. So when the RFPs are open, at that particular point, it's placed on the city record, and any okay. entity that's interested in applying for the RFP can go through the process and apply. If they have questions, we can respond to some of the questions, but because it's an RFP, um, it becomes a little bit, um, tricky in the navigation because the RFP is government is now. tricky I didn't know I never uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I thank you for your ca candidness on that um, it is important and I've had this uh, discussion um, with both Commissioner Banks and, and Administrator Bonilla um, because it uh, you know I've, I've my over 30 years in and around government I have found um, that people want to get um, social services from people who look and sound like them and it gets more people in the door. Um, oftentimes, people don't come out um, to get the services that they need. And when you're talking about DV services, is probably nothing more critical that uh, government provides. So I want to thank you um, for that answer and, and uh, for HRA's uh, willingness and, and more um, to bring those folks in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, chairs. Thank you, Councilmember Gredenchik. Uh, Councilmember Lander. Uh, thanks very much, uh, and thank you for all your work and your testimony today. Um, I want to follow up on two things that have been uh, talked about already. Um, one was the question that I that I asked Alita, and I just want to make sure I understand it. I know you've made some adjustments in the system to try to make that transition easier. Um, but I, I really don't understand why it's not more seamless than it is. Obviously, there's the question of how long, the question of having enough beds, all the things you're already talking about. And, and of course, we'd never, we'd, you know, it's, it's a failure, not a, you know, when somebody who's been in one of the DV shelters 
uh, hits the end of their time there, can't find a, a per permanent housing, and has to go to a tier two shelter. So we should work to diminish that as much as we possibly can. But when it happens, uh, it's not clear to me why that is treated as like a re-entry to the tier two homeless system instead of just a, like HRA manages both those, you know, or is in, you know, both those systems. And whoever you're working with at the DV shelter ought to be able to do your intake arrange the shelter that you would be transitioning to and, and enable a smooth transition, not one that anyone would be happy with, but still better than like the trauma of going back to PATH and having to then be replaced. So help me understand this. So you are correct. And that was brought to our attention in 2016. We met with DV advocates, um, NGVB, and our providers and we heard the, and, and the survivors, and to hear the process of trying to navigate our system in a DHS system. So in 2017, we worked in collaboration with DHS, our sister agency, and we streamlined the process. This way, when an individual is in our system or family, and they have to transition to DHS, they do not have to go through PATH. They, so what we happens now is we do all of that intake behind the scenes, we work with them, and they are assigned an actual shelter in DHS without having to go through PATH. Okay. Because we understand as um, the woman, the survivor before testified, and I can understand going through this process is you know, traumatic, you have to leave what you know to go to a new system, and we wanted to make it as welcoming as possible and not stress the, the survivors out any more than necessary. So we do have a streamlined process in place and it is working. And what will happen is that until that DHS unit is available to them, they will remain in our system. One other thing I would, else I would like to point out is that if a survivor is in our system and they are timing out and they have found an apartment, we will maintain them in our system until that apartment is available to them. Okay. All right, thank you. That's helpful to hear, and I'm glad those changes have been have been made. And you know, that's that's not as as you're agreeing and I'm agreeing. Like that's not success. That's not what any of us want. Um, but it's good to know at least that um, you can get the extension of time if you've got a lease, and you can move smoothly to a tier two shelter without having to essentially become homeless again. So thank you for that. Um, the other questions I want to ask build on the, the chair's question about uh, ASEA uh, uh, women's shelter. The, the uh, you know, I don't know if you got to read that quite remarkable time story, but um, one of the women on the chain that helped uh, Ms. Zahan in that story uh, get free uh, was Shahana Hanif, who's is my uh, organizing director. And, and it, was, it was quite a remarkable story um, that really required a lot of people in that chain to, uh, to help somebody es escape. And, um, you know, I, I was, of course, we were all in, my, in our office and our community really proud that Shahana was, was a part of that chain. And just by good, you know, it was a lot of steps of good luck. Like, was it good luck that the upstander was there, um, that she reached out on Facebook, that somebody else on Facebook knew to tag Shahana, that Shahana knew that ASEA existed and was able to build that that bridge, um, um, and I think you know some of what of Chair, what Chair Rosenthal was getting at is like, how do we make that less lucky happenstance and more a system that the city's offering to reach out to people, which is hard in a lot of different languages to people who are vulnerable and um, here without a lot of contacts. So you know, um, what are the things that we can do to deploy a system that can reach out as much as possible? Um, and then I guess I also want to ask, you know, some of what I learned in the wake of it is the challenge that particularly Muslim women have in dealing with the system we currently have. Um, you know, and some of this is at the HRA centers where there's not space to pray, where there's not halal food. Um, you know, obviously we're working on translation, but you know, that's a challenge as well. And, and I just want to know, both within the HRA system itself and with your contracted 
providers, what the steps that you are taking. You know, we, we kind of use cultural competence as a shorthand and we all want it, but then it gets really hard down in the details to deliver it. Um, and especially at this moment in time, facing the public charge legislation, just all the reasons that people have to fear engagement with the system. Can you talk a little more about the steps that you're taking within HRA itself and with your contracted providers to, uh, to build the system that we really want to have that makes sure folks have the greatest possible chance of, of getting free in ways that, are, that work? So on the HRA side, within our system, we ensure that we provide culturally sensitive training to all of our providers and our staff. We do ensure that immigrants feel welcome when we provide services to them, that we ensure that we have the language um, access that is available, and that is why we extended that language access to our DV providers to ensure that they have the same level of access as we do in HRA to ensure that um, the communication is happening and it's happening correctly, that we're not using untrained um, interpreters but trained interpreters. We definitely want people to access our services um, on the large scale, and again, in collaboration with the mayor's office to NGBV, we basically work collaboratively to ensure that the services we provide meet the needs of all. So language access is, is oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, were you, okay. did you? I mean, language access is essential, uh, so it's one, but it's really just one element. So I just want, again, you know, what I learned in the wake of the, you know, uh, of that incident was, and uh, I think we're going to hear a little more about it today, about some other barriers that, that folks face. Um, so I just wonder to what extent, and, and, you know, what I heard about was, was particularly issues that Muslim women face, but there may be others. So are there some examples of changes you've made in the system? You know, again, you know, what I, what I heard about was sort of opportunities to pray, halal food, private space to breastfeed, some of the kinds of things that just would make people comfortable in the centers. Um, so I would just add to what our colleague said that we are constantly doing outreach to communities um, and trying to do it in partnership with communities. We've actually done a number of roundtables with Muslim faith leaders and with CBOs serving um, Muslim women. And so we need to continue that outreach and do it in partnership with you because you're really the experts in your community. Um, we do have a number of culturally specific providers on site and I, I need to meet with Asiya obviously right away. Um, so I look forward to setting up that meeting. <laughs> Um, and but and I, they're fantastic, and yeah. I'm thrilled to provide them a little member yeah. item. But this is not a, I mean, the point here, and they, you know, they don't think it either. I mean, this is not a, like, no, you know. know, please honor Asia. This is a, let's do, let's do Definitely. everything we can. I mean, you know, Muslim women are a lot of the women Definitely. in our city, and we just want to make sure the system, and, you know, the, everybody faces barriers, mm -hmm. escaping. Yeah. Uh, abusers dealing with our communities, like that's across all lines, but we just, we will need to build a system that shows up for everybody. Yeah, and we need to address the gaps and the barriers that people are raising with us. Um, and we do have Arab American Family Support Center on site at all five of our centers, so we've yeah. been doing a lot of work and we need to broaden our partnerships. Um, I would also say that we do, we have placed a lot of emphasis on training our providers at the Family Justice Centers and we mandate culturally specific and culturally competent um, training before people even start on site. And we do that in partnership with our wonderful providers here. They're the ones doing that training on site at the centers. It's also offered to the domestic violence providers. I would also like to add it with our shelters. We do have shelters that are culturally um, specific and that they, they do work with certain groups of the population. However, they are required to take in, you know, everyone. So, but we do have cer certain of our providers that are specialized in certain areas and can provide targeted services. In addition to that, we do have the best practices that we work with with our providers. And when we hear of um, situations where we feel that we're not responding appropriately or we don't have the level of service that's needed, we're definitely willing to explore and to see what we can do to become more inclusive than we already are. 
And, and I appreciate the tension, obviously. Uh, you know, halal food's a good example. It'd be easier to have one, you know, a, a dedicated set of places where you contracted with food services providers who provided it, but the human rights law requires that all of the programs be available to everyone. So, you know, that's a tension in, in doing this, this work. We just want to be, make sure we're being mindful of it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate those answers. I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Um, so I'll, I'll keep my, my questions as succinct as I can. So, um, so uh, around mental health in, within the system, kind of in the continuum of the system, um, you heard the testimony um, of the survivor before. And I was encouraged, on the one hand, um, that she was able to receive the type of, um, the type of, of therapeutic uh, services that she was able to receive on site by the provider. Um, uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was a little bit concerned that when her six months were up, that that discontinued, um, you know, except for her extraordinary um, effort to keep that connection with the person that she had been um, in services with. Um, so that leads to a, a, a couple of questions that I have. First is, where is the baseline for therapeutic mental health services in the DV emergency system? Where's the baseline? What is the, because that, maybe that one provider is able to supplement their funding f with privately raised funding and is able to hire a licensed clinical social worker or psychologist um, that is, that specializes in PTSD or domestic violence trauma and, um, and is able to, and, and th th that that provider is able to do that. There are 19 providers uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the DV shelters emergency system. Um, how do we ensure that on site that level of care is afforded to everybody that enters the system regardless of which provider they're assigned to? So for the emergency system, they do provide crisis services because this is the first entry into our system. And the providers that are there do have um, social workers that can provide services, and they have linkages that can provide even further services. As you mentioned, some providers do have other funding that can, that service can continue with that provider post-discharge from the shelter, but others are referred to uh, FJCs or other community providers that can provide aftercare services for them after they leave our system. So before we get to aftercare though, on site, I just wanna make sure, so when you say social workers, that's MSWs or uh, licensed clinical social workers? They are MSWs. I don't believe that they're all licensed clinical. I believe mm -hmm. that they have the ability to go with either MSWs or LCSWs. Okay, um, and, 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 um, and, the, and the clients are, this is a, are able to see these social workers in a, on a regular basis, um, kind of at any time that they need them or are able to make an appointment that is, um, you know, time responsive? Yes, and as um, I testified earlier, the hours are staggered to meet the needs because these are individuals mm -hmm. and families who are coming to our system for the first time a lot of them for the first time. So yes, the services are available on an as-needed basis. Throughout the emergency system? Yes. So, so every, every client of the, of the 2,000 some odd beds that are in the emergency system has, the, has access to a kind of regular mental health um, relationship with the provider? Yes, either on-site or through linkages. Okay, sorry, so on, the, not all of them are on-site. So they have social workers that are on site, but that, as you well know, some people need more than a social worker. Okay. So then that would be the linkages. Okay. Um, 
are do you, are you do you have a mechanism to get feedback from clients on how well that is working throughout the system? Well, this confidentiality um, rule that just went into effect by the June. state in June kind of limits how much information we can pull from shelters. Mm -hmm. So we can speak to them about it, but in terms of actually going to a client to find mm -hmm. out client-specific information, if they have not signed a confidentiality agreement, we cannot speak with them. What other ways then are you able to kind of do quality assurance in terms of mental health, um, mental health services on site in, de in the emergency system? So in collaboration with the state when they make their visits for assessments, they review the records which are redacted with the client information and from there we can see what services are being provided to who and when. That would probably be the best way to respond to that question. Okay. Is there additional Thrive resources that are specific to the emergency DV system? We use Thrive resources for the um, New York City Well, which we've advertised mm -hmm. to our providers. They've um, provided presentations to the providers, so we use that to enhance the services that are already in place in the shelters so that if someone at two o'clock in the morning gets up and I really need to talk to somebody and there's no one at the shelter, that's where the New York City well comes in because it can enhance what the shelters already provide. Have you, how are you able to um, uh, gauge the effectiveness of, or the utilization of NYC well in the emergency DV system? In other words, how, how are you able to know whether anyone's using it? Honestly, I don't, we don't have a mechanism to do that. We just ensure that the services are provided. We do mm -hmm. know that we're receiving younger people into shelter, mm -hmm. younger women with just one or two children who are more apt to text, chat, use mm -hmm. electronic devices. Mm -hmm. So we just would like to offer that as an addendum to what is currently being provided in our shelters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when it comes to aftercare, um, this is, I think, an area that is ripe for investment um, throughout the system. And we've worked with, we've piloted with Henry Street Settlement here at the council through our children and families in, uh, in, 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 in homelessness, um, our initiative, which is kind of flexible um, funding and kind of pilot funding on aftercare services with Henry Street. And um, it has great success. Um, in fact, uh, the testimony that we heard from, from the survivor earlier, um, uh, Ms. Um, uh, Chikembo, Chik, I will, I'll, I'm not good at the pronunciation, but um, that what we, what we heard was how important maintaining that linkage to her provider beyond the, that six months was. And, and in, our uh, in our initiative out of the council with Henry Street, we see how, um, how effective that is uh, within a within a tier two population, within a general um, DHS family population. So, how how are we exploring with um, with within the emergency system how to uh, how to advance or expand aftercare services? So that is a great model, um, and we thank you for funding that. It's really a wonderful model. And for those that participate or take advantage of it, it's great. We are exploring and looking at different models of how we can mm -hmm. look at aftercare. I just would like to caution, though, that that model doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Sure. So it works for a, 
a portion of the population, but there's another population that when they leave shelter, I don't want anything to do with this. Right. Let me go on my way. If I seek aftercare, you know, I'll do it on my own. And that's their right to self-determination, right? Yeah. So it is a good model, um, but there are other models. So I think we sure. just, as part of best practices, we'll yeah. look at it and see, you know, what can be. I mean, we also have it here with one of our providers, Sarah, Bro Sarah Burke. They also have that a similar model that they self-fund. Mm -hmm. And again, it works for a segment of the population. Absolutely, right. It's voluntary. Um, and I think that, I mean, kind of exploring, I mean, the where I'm going with this is exploring how we can make it um, not necessarily just a self, you know, a self-funded um, uh, type of program, but that the city could invest in in different models of of aftercare. Um, I mean, I'd like to see that throughout the tier two system. I think a good place to start would be with the DV emergency system because it is, um, you know, it's it's not the the the, the, the it, would, it would be more the numbers aren't as big. It would, it would be it would be a, I think an effective place to start. Um, what are we doing around um, things like financial literacy in the in the in the DV system, um, and how where where is there an opportunity to invest in in those types of programming, and and where would we where do we see an opportunity in terms of like programmatic success? Like wh where do we think that that could go? Um, in terms of its effectiveness? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we collaborate with financial literacy. It is something that we have found to be quite beneficial to mm -hmm. our DV survivors. Um, URI has a program. Sanctuary for, Sanctuary for Families has a program that's longstanding. Mm -hmm. There's several others that have programs that have proven to be um, beneficial to our survivors where they learn the skills to translate to jobs that pay an, a, you know, a living wage where they can live independently. It is something that we are expanding and we look forward in partnership to mm -hmm. make it happen. So, so the URI and Sanctuary are self are self funding those programs or those. So, Sanctuary for Families is a program that we provide funding for. URI is self funding. Um, and um, each of the providers um, has a budget line for economic empowerment uh, staff and I see. programming. Okay, so that's how that's how Sanctuary is fu is funding their program. Um, in terms of kind of. Uh, professional development for providers, um, we should really explore what are, you know, th through some kind of evidence-based models, I'm sure they're, that they're out there on, on financial um, empowerment, um, particularly with, with, the, with the survivor, the domestic violence survivor population. I mean, things, things are like um, disentangling your finances from your abuser. Yes. Um, uh, setting up your own bank account if you had a joint bank account. Um, things, things like that. I mean, that's the, the, the there's, um, I think anyone can benefit from financial yeah. literacy, um, including myself, you know, like anyone can, everyone can, can benefit from that. Um, I think in particular survivors of domestic violence that are fl fleeing an abuser and, and may have to s do some unilateral disentanglement, um, uh, there's, I think there's greater need uh, for, for, for those types of services. Um, so I totally agree. And we actually have a pretty robust package of financial empowerment services okay. at each of the family justice centers. And we've been working to enhance those referral networks with the domestic violence shelters. We recently opened a classroom for clients at our Manhattan Family Justice Center. Sanctuary <coughs> runs their work readiness program there. And they recruit from the shelters and the non-res programs and the FJCs. So we've been working really hard to even offer different options like mm -hmm. entrepreneurship programs, financial literacy classes. I too could benefit from those if you have a 13 week program on site. Um, and we also have career readiness and career workshops um, that different providers come in and offer. So we're always looking to enhance mm -hmm. those services because we completely agree that it's key. And we have financial clinic on site doing financial right. coaching sessions as well. Right, because I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that financial issues, the broader set of financial issues, are probably a, a, a leading reason why somebody might go back to an abuser. Definitely. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and just make breaking free from an abusive relationship, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's a major hurdle. Huge. Major hurdle. Huge. Mm -hmm. We also have um, HRAs actually on site at each of our FJCs, um, mm -hmm. and they're able to detangle case issues that come up when you need to get off of an abusive partner's cash assistance case. So we're looking at that right, right from the outset when we're providing that on benefits. assistance. Mm -hmm. How about with, I mean, is there partnerships with any banks or consortium of banks or credit unions or on, on setting, you know, streamlining, setting up a bank account? It, you know, yeah. getting the proper identification and whatever you need to, yeah. to, to be able to do that. So all of our great providers do work with the um, clients to prepare them when they're doing that. We've actually started to explore some partnerships with banks. To It would be wonderful to have, like, safe bank accounts that survivors mm -hmm. could access. Um, and so that's something that we're hoping to explore. Okay. So mental health, financial services, I think, are two areas that I would love to, over the next two years, I'm only here for another two years. <laughs> I'd really like to help work with you guys, make some strides on, on making sure that there's some good baseline mm -hmm. services on those two areas so that at the very least, everybody is getting, has, has, has access to those really essential components because mm -hmm. um, that's where you're able to build towards success is if you have, if, you're, if you and your children are able to work through the trauma of of um, of going through the this whole situation, this this, this whole experience in life, um, and and you know, I mean, the percentage of people that are that are in the emergency system that are have, have been diagnosed with PTSD is, do you know what that number is? It's high. I think it's some I mean, based on national research, I would imagine it's quite high because yes. there's so much underlying trauma, you know, yes. and, but I don't think we have any city studies on that. I think at some point it was over 50% of actual diagnosis, mm -hmm. and that's just actual diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think it's just fair to assume that everybody has experienced some form of trauma and are dealing with that in some way. Um, and, so, and so really when we're talking about giving people what they need um, through this system. It's th I think those are two areas where I think we could really uh, work together on, and, and you have my commitment to um, you know, putting in the time to do that with you all. Um, Thank you. And then my, I'm sorry, I just, my, my last sorry, question, my last question <laughs> has to do with capacity. And um, how many people are actually turned away that qualify for for emergency placement but are but are turned away on capacity issues that there's just not a bed for them so in the system as I testified earlier what we do is we make every effort to provide shelter to those who apply for our system because of the emergencies it runs on a bed system not a unit system we have to write have to have the right configuration so even if, let's say, you apply today and you need a one-in-one, one, that's one adult, one child, in Brooklyn, a certain part of Brooklyn, and we have a shelter there, but they don't have an opening today, but they may have an opening in a week, we will continue to call you, and when that mm -hmm. unit becomes available, we will definitely you know, bring you into our system. Mm -hmm. So we do keep in contact with you to try to make every effort to fit you to that unit? I mean, I think a, a, a probably a safe going assumption is that we need more emergency shelters and we need more tier two shelters. I think that that's a, I don't, I mean, I think we're, that's even, even waiting for the outcome of the, those beds that have come online from 2015, why not right now in 20, because that was four years ago, why not do more uh, more tier two beds and more emergency beds. Um, we know that the demand is there. There's no, there's no way that those that 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 if we brought on the capacity that it would not be utilized. We don't have any excess capacity in this system. No. Yeah. So let's let's just invest in them. With that, you know, let's let's get on the let's do another round of this. Uh, of of uh, of, an, of uh, bringing on more capacity. 
So I, I think that that's maybe something that we should work on in the next two years. We, should, we shouldn't just leave it at the 2015, num the, the 2015 effort. We should be doing another round of, of, of up upgrading the system or expanding the system. So with that, I'll turn it back to my co-chair. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. A couple of just really quick questions, because I know we have providers who are waiting to testify, so I'd like to run through these quickly, if that's all right with you. You mentioned that there's a new electronic check-in system that's coming. I'm wondering if that could include some sort of vault, the way that Passport has a vault, where you could upload, a survivor could upload paperwork, and maybe then there's, you know, like, Here's, you know, a doctor's note, hospital note for where somebody is staying. Mm -hmm. And then there could be some sort of online dashboard that a survivor could track. So it's there. we do have a system that's a little bit old, and we are working with that system to incorporate this electronic attendance. It is a process that we're phasing in, and there will be several phases to um, the implementation, one of the, one of it, right now is that a provider could indicate whether that is a documented absence or undocumented absence, but the paperwork is submitted through a different source. So that is something we will be exploring, exploring in the future. Thank you very much. Um, I want to get back to uh, the TGNC population where it's a, a more of a challenge because of the need more often than not for single beds. Mm -hmm. Um, a room with a single. Um, is, is there any training given to intake uh, staff and the provider staff to let them know they really have to take these individuals? So transgender non-conforming um, survivors are treated like anyone else. Mm. So we don't make a distinction that, you know, that we don't accept them, so we treat them all the same. And if they come in and we have a available bed and they meet the criteria, they will be housed. Right, and is there ever a situation, do you know, and I know I asked this just a little bit before, but where they're sent to a provider and then the provider says no? So provide Where maybe the provider might say, and, and I'm only asking this, of course, because I've heard stories about this, that where the provider might say, oh, you know, I can hear your voice, you're, you're, we, and saying it or not saying it is basically saying, we thought, we see you're female presenting, but you have such a deep voice. That's just not gonna work out in our shelter. Do you know, since, since, since there are those who've had those experiences, so we know that, and we know, of course, what your policy is and that you're open to everyone. I'm not questioning that. I'm questioning reality. And given reality, how do we address those issues? Our providers, when they assess individuals, they have the opportunity to ensure that the individual or family that they're bringing into their shelter, it's a good fit for both. What does that mean? So what it means is that, you know, you have people who say, I want to come into domestic violence shelter, but they don't understand that there's rules associated with coming into the shelter. So you're saying that trans women don't understand the rules? No, that's not what I'm saying. Absolutely not. What I'm saying is that anyone who comes into our system, they have to abide by the confidentiality rules, that they cannot share the address, that there's meetings and groups. Please. And some, let me just... I'm, I'm just trying to answer. And at that particular point in time, the shelter and the individual, they work together to make sure that this is a good fit for both. However, if you have stories like this and if they come to your attention, I would welcome to please share them with us because we will definitely address it with the providers. Now, that particular story that you just shared with us, that has not come to my attention, but if it does, we will address it with the You've provider. You've never heard of a situation where an intake, an HRA, maybe a NOVA staff person recommends somebody who's transgender to a shelter and the provider changes their mind upon recognition of this person's uh, gender status. 
That has You've not come never to my heard attention. that story. That has not come to my attention. But if it does, if it comes to your attention, I welcome the opportunity for you. I mean, to my understanding, there are 40 to 50 people who are turned away a year, who are transgender. 40 to 50 a year. So it's disappointing. I mean, I would. So I'm going to leave it right there. That's okay. Um, I want to go to the FJCs just a little bit. Um, uh, sorry, to NGBV. Has this ever come to your attention? Do you train HRIA staff on these issues? Do you do trainings with the providers on these issues? So NGBV does have a policy and training institute. Um, and the focus of the training team within that um, unit is to train city agency and contracted providers on a whole cadre of trainings. In addition, we offer trainings at the family justice centers, um, both core trainings and more advanced trainings that are open to FJC providers and also the general public. Um, so we do have a wider range, wide range of trainings that are available and that we're conducting. And we require training of our front end screening staff and reception staff who are often the first person greeting someone into the space um, and talking about the services. We do require SOGI training for them on a regular basis. The providers, it's my understanding, the executive directors or the, or the head of the, each of the provider mm -hmm. uh, shelters yeah. have monthly meetings. Have you ever attended those? We attend them on a regular basis. So we what is, does regular mean you attend every month? We attend every month. It's either myself or our director of FJC operations, Denise Jenkins. And, and what's your role in those meetings? So we're often asked by um, our colleagues to present on new programs at the Family Justice Centers to raise awareness about those programs and make referrals. Um, and we are in regular collaboration around the meeting agenda. Right, I'm, I have to wrap this up because a survivor has to go to a court appearance. So I have to wrap this up. Um, I wanna be on the record saying that I have uh, three or four more really pressing questions. I'm not gonna be able to ask them publicly. So we'll include them in a follow-up letter to you. They're pretty basic questions. Do you think you can agree to get the answers back to us without even knowing what the questions are? But even if the answer <laughs> is, I don't know, within two weeks? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna call it a day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to call uh, Dania Danush and uh, Leila Mohammed. And, and we'll also call up uh, Urban Resources Institute because I know that they have to leave as well. We would encourage members of the administration to stay to sort of hear what we're hearing from lived experiences. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Leila Mohammed. I'm a, I arrived here in New York in uh, February, uh, so I'm so new, <laughs> last February. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm a domestic violence survivor, and I didn't even knew that I'm a domestic violence um, because until I met Dania, uh, ICA Women's Center. Um, this is the moment when I was going did an interview for her, with her about where should I stay and leave and sleep, and then I found out what is my real situation. Um, as a domestic violence survivor in Asia Women's Center, which is a private shelter, we had to go. And honestly, sorry for my words are really kind of because I wasn't here for testify. I only was here to support my director. That I really appreciate every single thing she do to us. Um, challenging in New York is something huge. If it's gonna put you all the way up high to the sky to fly, or it's gonna bury you under the ground if you're not prepared, if you're not being ready for it. Challenging how to use simple things. For all of you, it's like daily thing, like not big thing. For me, it was big. Using transportation, subway, it was a difficult thing. 
getting lost every single time to get in the subway. Um, knowing about the coins is something. We needed education. I needed to learn how not to get lost anymore. But because of the limit, limited sources that we had in the, in the shelter, as it's not that much of things being offered, as we couldn't have too much employee to help, I had to struggle with learning every single thing. She's there for me all the time. I'm walking around with her laptop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, uh, I appreciate New York a lot. In the beginning, I felt that I might be unwelcomed as, as you see me. Um, really totally stranger outside this country with a really not usual look, let's say. Um, I was so in need to receive any kind of support that I made a decision and I informed Dani about it that I'm willing, God willing, the moment I stand up in my feet, I'm starting an institute to teach people how to use subway, how to learn. Wallahi, I'm serious. It's, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but it's big. It's big to know the difference on the coins between the diamond and the one cent. This is, I had to struggle not eating or drinking for three days, and I didn't knew that I have $5 coins. I didn't knew that. So a lot of work needed, uh, a lot of support needed. Um, not too much hands. It's almost weak hands we, we, we have here. I um, appreciate every single help I received. I went to the Family Justice Center. They were helpful, but not that much of help I received. I appreciate everything they did, but it wasn't enough for a person in my situation, being me. I, I, like, go, I tried to go to, to, to sit to have it because I had an appointment. I couldn't arrive in my time because I was, as usual, lost in New York, <laughs> like every time. Um, emotion support, this is what definitely we need. Next to financial support for the shelter. So they can give us the emotional support that we need, educate us, workshop, classes, how to stand up. How can I stand up and go and earn my own place? How can I stand up and just enter the door to have my own work, my own job, you know, because it's not the same because everything, every time I do something, everyone's telling me, Leila, this is America, this is US, this is New York. It's something different. And I really wanna know what is the different. And to do that, I need someone who's really free to have a free time to teach me, to help me. I'm jumping on her every time while she's working, trying to get more jobs so she can offer us the money and the thing to help us. Simple thing, but it's different. Make a different, make a huge difference. So I really wanted to appreciate you people to have me here. And Dania, Asia Women's Center is something huge, but it's small. And it could be bigger. It could be not just for Muslims. It could be for every single different people. They can have their own, but they need support. So I'm going to let it the rest for Dania. Thank you, Dania. Yeah. And I just want to say that uh, you said that you appreciate New York. New York appreciates you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Leila, thank you. Love you so much. Uh, my name is Dania Darwish. I am the executive director of the Asia Women's Center. At this time, we do not receive any funding from the government, and we don't receive any money from HRA and I do not know why. I do not get paid for my work at ASIA. I do it simply because I find very few things as appalling as domestic violence. As a result, I juggle two jobs. One job full time that I've had to take time off of at Freedom for Immigrants, um, and another job which I consider the ASIA Women Center, and LSAT studying as well. Um, so I do 
everything from answering emergency calls at 2 a.m., editing CVs, going to court with women and advocating for them in the face of their abusers. We actually have to run right after this. Um, I research family and immigration law. I've even held one of our clients while she was 40 hours in labor, held up her legs for her, watched that, appreciated my mother so much more. Um, our second baby at the Asia Women's Center was delivered just this week. Um, she's so beautiful, and uh, we share the same name. Um, and um, I entered the C-section room with her, uh, stayed for all three nights at the hospital. We were discriminated at against in the hospital because she didn't speak English, had to file a report at the hospital. I know how to change diapers, I know how to feed, I know how to take photos of deep blue bruises and help women report. I know how to change tires. I know the signs of a miscarriage that happened because of domestic violence. And I've learned how to help women breathe through panic attacks, things I never thought I'd know how to do in my life, or at least not this soon. As a proud New Yorker, I never thought I knew how to learn how to drive. Um, but I was p pushed to because um, when women want to escape at night, I'm the person that picks them up and takes them away from their abusers. My parents, they tell me I need to work on my love life, but I can't because I'm the only woman or one of the only women in my community doing this to this level of depth. And I wish it wasn't me just doing this. I wish we had more funding. I wish that there were more resources. To tell you a little bit about the ASIA Women's Center, we offer temporary transitional housing to survivors of domestic violence and victims of homelessness. Um, we have a specific mission to address the gap in um, appropriate residential services for the MMSA population, which is Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Middle Eastern. Uh, we were created as a project for from Muslims Giving Back in August of 2018, and since we opened up, we have helped over 75 women and children. This was as of three months ago, this number. One out of every three women experiences domestic violence in the United States, but for the Muslim community, it's one out of every two. Um, and before we provided housing, we, uh, at domestic, we at Muslims Giving Back, we used to refer survivors to shelters and organizations, and um, that's how they received support. However, many clients reported that they experienced hostility, difficulty to access services due to language barriers, and one time when we dropped off a client, she said that she called us the next day crying, saying that they told her to take off her damn headscarf, and we knew then we needed a solution. At our facility, we have 20 beds available, and I've had to turn down, I've had to turn away countless of people, and every time I have to do that, it's such a struggle for me. We partner with multiple community-based organizations, such as the Reciprocity Foundation, to provide a range of mental health and medical services for our clients, and we work closely with the Brooklyn, New York City Family Justice Center for social services, civil, legal, and criminal justice assistance by referring our clients there. In the past year, my experience with the New York City Family Justice Center, um, we've had some challenges. One of our biggest challenge is that um, there is not substantial support in identifying permanent housing for domestic violence survivors with a pending case in criminal court. Um, because if they tried to seek that support, um, then that would, that would impact their case. Um, and one of our clients, her husband knew the court system, and she was a recent immigrant, and he reported first. He filed the order of protection first, and now she has to go through extensive criminal proceedings, and she can't get housing now. Um, as a result of the public service law that's going into effect on October 15th, a lot of my clients are afraid, and I also am afraid. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen to them. Their inability to get public benefits while 
they are trying to seek a pathway for citizenship, it's going to deter them from even wanting to stay in this country. They're going to want to return to their abusers as a result. Um, Every time a woman in my center re returns to her abuser, I feel like I failed her, and I feel like our system has failed her. And um, that's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you. For, for the testimony, for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, and just a quick question. Which, which hospital? You said that the hospital, there was a discrimination against one of your clients? Richmond University Medical Center. Which one? Richmond University Medical Center. Thank you. Thank we'll, you. We'll follow up with that. It's really powerful. Um, and you can submit your testimony online. Thank you. We'll make sure that happens. Really appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you so much. And if anyone needs to leave, they, they should, you know, no, no obligation to stay here. I think we have like five minutes to spare. <laughs> Thank you for uh, sharing your story and all that you do. I apologize if I sound a little nasal. I'm recovering or attempting to recover from um, a cold. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Dr. Carla Smith. Um, I jump in. One sure. of the things that I'm so excited for you to talk about, and I know everyone's on a crunch, we have your testimony. I think what I've heard about you and your eye is that you just have this exceptional model for um, training and making sure everyone's very cognizant about all different types of populations. And I was wondering, I specifically am hoping you would focus on how we can make sure that the rest of the shelter system can follow the model that you've laid out to make sure everyone's trained, but trained repeatedly, that we know people really have integrated into who they are all different types of populations. So could I ask you, I, could I trouble you, only because I know everyone's short of time, to focus on that? Sure, so, you know, uh, while we um, are working to continue to make sure that we're providing culturally competent services, you know, there are a lot of people in New York City who are doing excellent work. Um, and we're doing good work and moving towards excellence. But we know we can't do that by ourselves, so we work with other partners, um, Anti-Violence Project in particular, as well as other experts in sort of the diversity, equity, inclusion arena to make sure that our staff are uh, informed, trained, and that includes from the top down. Um, we started with our executive staff and our senior staff to make sure that we were all on the same page um, in shifting towards an open access model of care, truly being open access to any person who called our hotline um, who needed to access shelter. And so um, in order to do that, we took some pretty significant steps and in, in being really intentional about not only thinking about the training that our staff needed, but um, the space, what we needed to do to make our space inclusive. So we have a facilities department an operations team that looked at space. Um, how do we make that space diverse, inclusive, welcoming to the many different kinds of clients that we're serving, taking into consideration intersecting identities? So materials in the space, gender neutral bathrooms, um, and not just for our clients, but for our staff. We have a very diverse staff um, that work at the organization. In terms of the services, really working with the experts first of all, to understand, number one, who we're serving, right? So in many ways, providers don't ask those detailed questions. So taking a look at our intake and assessment tools that we're using to make sure that those are inclusive, that our staff are trained around how to ask questions in a way that we, will make a person feel welcomed. And so that staff understand the language that they're using. So we've incorporated and expanded our orientation um, within the organization to a five-day orientation at central office where before you actually walk into the space of a shelter, you go through an intensive five-day, all-day orientation on a number of different topics. Uh, LGBTQ cultural competency is one of those topics that we incorporate. We've also, um, in our work with AVP, will be planning to do ongoing sort of 
cultural competency 2.0 or working with children of LGBT identified individuals. Sort of really helping staff to understand not just the baseline information that you need to be able to work with an individual, but all of those different things that come up over the course of time so that they have the tools and the skills that they need to be able to provide culturally competent services. And not just based on gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, but all those intersecting identities that come into play and, want, and help you, will we'll have you design services that meet those specific needs. So, and then when a person goes, leaves that sort of orientation period, and they step into the shelter environment, the idea is that they are matched with another staff person. You're not just sort of released to do the work. You're matched with another staff person who's been in the space, who understands how URI is operating, and can partner with you and mentor you through for, uh, for a period of time to do the work. We also um, highlight right in the beginning URI's commitment to the open access model of care. We believe in that model. We let people know that we understand that everybody comes with what they've learned, right? Their own lens. But that we ask them to leave their bag at the door. They can pick it up on the way out if they feel comfortable. But while they're in our environment, we are responsible for the lives of the people that we're serving. And whether you're at the front desk as a security guard or you're a direct service provider, the way you interact with a person will impact whether or not they decide to stay. Has, um, have, you ever, have you worked at all with NGBV or uh, to give them that training? We haven't worked with them to give them training. We work with AVP. We work with, um, our, some of our staff have gone to trainings at other places, Sorry. but we have not provided training to them. Right, and I sort of asked that question backwards, I think. Does, has FJC, has NGBV ever reached out to you to understanding, to understand the breadth and depth of your training better and maybe adopt that for other shelter providers? Well, we, sh we share information with them. This is a, a new model for us as we've sort of developed um, our, the divisions and we've grown as an, as an organization um, over time. We actually established a quality improvement evaluation and training department. And so that department is responsible for um, wow. doing observational, um, collecting observational data for going into the shelters and doing chart reviews, our own in sort of internal system, evaluating whether our services are trauma-informed, not just by looking at charts, but by actually observing client sessions, you know, provided that the client consents. And then providing feedback to the program leaders at those sites who are leading those shelters, as well as developing trainings that come out of that to enhance our staff ability to provide services. We're also developing a tracking system. You mentioned a question earlier to another person around denials. So really understanding, we're developing our own internal dashboard, not just around utilization, but really understanding why people are being turned away so that our program leaders or program directors who are licensed clinical social workers for the most part and our quality improvement evaluation and training team can go in and periodically pull copies of hotlines to sort of see why are people being um, turned away? Is that denial appropriate? Do we need to do any training for staff um, so that we can track internally for our own organization over time why people are sort of not getting access to shelter. We've been very intentional about, in the development of all our new sites, about setting aside spaces for singles. Now, that doesn't mean we're setting aside spaces only for LGBTQ. There are other people who identify as single, so we don't hold spaces. We take people as they you know, need to come into shelter, provided we have availability, also singles with pets. <coughs> but we're tracking more information, collecting more data that will help uh, to inform how we continue to develop our services. Do you get additional, how do you get funding for this model? It's very intensive. Well, we, uh, we use the resources that we have in terms of the per diem that we get. So we have a full complement of staff, um, case managers, social workers, housing specialists. Um, we also, because we've grown a lot, the organization has really invested a lot of resources into infrastructure, building that, qu that quality improvement team. We understand that 
we don't just want to be a good provider, we want to be an excellent provider. And that means we need to be able to look at our own work over time and evaluate um, what we need. We also apply for private resources, private funding. Uh, someone mentioned our economic empowerment program. We actually received a grant. We received funding from city council for, from Dove to support that program. And we received a private uh, foundation uh, grant to develop an economic empowerment center that victims of domestic violence, including homeless, uh, homeless families, including victims of domestic violence, will be able to access post shelter. So even Where if they've been located? in shelter. We're actually in the process of securing the final space. Hopefully, we will be in the Midtown area. Um, we're negotiating right now. That center will include job, job training, job placement, um, job coaching. Gotcha. But can we go back <laughs> to the intensive training that you do, like the five-day training, the quality review? Um, you're able to fund that out of your per diem, or do you get additional city funds or private funds just to run your program? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, you, I think you work with what you have. We do have a development, <clears throat> excuse me, a development department that does private fundraising to resource the organization um, in a manner that allows us to do the work that we're talking about. So part of it is city funding, and it's around uh, determining what your budget is going to look look like based on the resources that you get from the city and the state, but also identifying what private resources might be available to us to support that programming. Great. I'd love to follow up with you on that with an eye, with an eye toward how do we bring this to um, HRA and NGBV as a whole. Yeah, we, have a, we actually have an established uh, supervision protocol which talks about orientation and training, which I'd be happy to Oh, share. that would be great. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to share? No, I just, I, I mean, I, we understand that the needs far outweigh what we have as the current complement of, of uh, shelter availability, both on the emergency and the Tier 2 side. URI is working in partnership with HRA as well as a number of providers to make sure that um, any person in need um, with pet and tow can access shelter. Um, and so we will continue to expand our programming in order to be able to do that and that uh, people will be able to be welcomed into shelter, you know, in celebration of how they identify in all the ways that that, you know, tends to show itself. And do you have a sense of how many people are turned away because you just don't have space? Um, you know, I would have to pull the numbers and I could probably do that with, uh, for you. Over time, we, we currently have, we're the largest DV shelter uh, provider in the country at this point. We have 1,183 beds online right now. Um, on any given evening, we have um, some other sites that will be coming on. Um, you know, we we budget based on a 95% occupancy rate, um, and shelters they fill up quickly. When the beds become vacant, they fill up quickly. So I would have to look at the denial rate specifically. Great, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. your time and your staying late. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to call up the next panel. from the Anti-Violence Project, Catherine Chagru Dos Santos, from Safe Horizon, Jimmy Mager, from New Destiny Housing, uh, Alyssa Keel, and from the Coalition for Homeless Youth, Jamie uh, Polovich. If everyone come up and provide your testimony to the clerk, we'll then distribute it and Catherine, if you could get us started. Um, good morning, Chair. Good afternoon, I guess, by now. Um, Chair Rosenthal um, and everyone here. My name is Catherine Chagru Dos Santos, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director at the New York City Anti-Violence Project. AVP appreciates our partnership with the Council, um, specifically with your committees, um, with HRA and with NGBV, which has demonstrated strong leadership in ensuring New York City's domestic violence services remain relevant across sexual orientation and gender identity. In spite of promising work that's going on across the city, and I think including and especially the work that Carla just described at URI, we have a long way to go to make safe, confidential domestic violence shelter accessible to all survivors. Therefore, we support the bill 1712 um, and uh, other measures proposed by the council. Um, 
AVP is the HRA contracted New York City uh, LGBTQ specific non-residential domestic violence program. We're the only rape crisis center that is LGBTQ specific in the state. We run the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs and the New York State LGBTQ Intimate Partner Violence Network that the chair referenced uh, in her opening remarks. Uh, we know that domestic and intimate partner violence are as pervasive, dangerous, and deadly in LGBTQ relationships as they are in all relationships. Yet mainstream domestic violence service providers, especially shelter, is geared towards cisgender women abused by cisgender men, as has been pointed out over and over again today. This renders LGBTQ survivors invisible, particularly TGNC people, and gay and bisexual men with deadly consequences. And CAVP reported 11 homicides related to IPV in 2017, and we suspect that number is much higher, but is not widely reported due to that invisibility. So despite the anti-discrimination provisions part of the uh, 2013 Reauthorized Violence Against Women Act and the OCFS Administrative Directive issued in 2015, as we've heard over and over again today, there are precious few, even if the number is now over 30, uh, beds in New York City available at any time for survivors who do not identify as straight cisgender women with children. Here at AVP, our clients regularly report being turned away from shelters and having nowhere to stay, putting them at risk of further potentially deadly violence. Each year, millions of federal, state, and local public dollars are given to organizations to provide shelter to domestic violence survivors, and LGBTQ survivors are historically excluded from those shelter resources. In this climate of increasingly virulent, hateful rhetoric and escalating attacks on LGBTQ people on the streets, in their homes, at work, and in the public eye, survivors feel that they have nowhere to turn if they also face violence in their intimate relationships. Therefore, it's more urgent than ever to expand access to LGBTQ survivors. We must do more, and we cannot wait. We look forward to continuing this work together with HRA and NGBV um, as soon as possible. Specifically, we respectfully ask that in addition to passing the bills that are on the table today, uh, that the council work with the mayor to identify and release more funding to HRA and NGBV, to create space that can accommodate single survivors of intimate partner violence in domestic violence shelter across gender and sexual orientation, to provide more and deeper training, much like what Carla was discussing at URI that they've piloted, to mainstream shelter providers to really create that cultural shift that Carla discussed that's needed to really engage LGBTQ survivors effectively, to ensure compliance with local and federal laws, and to protect survivors from enduring further violence from shelter staff, volunteers, or residents once in the shelter system. Additionally, we recommend extending uh, and funding shelter staff beyond 180 days as housing challenges are even more significant for uh, trans and gender nonconforming folks, as the council knows well. AVP remains at the ready to continue our work with the council, with HRA, with NGBV, and our fellow domestic violence service providers to support these efforts. We extend our gratitude to the council to, for hearing our testimony and urge you to act quickly to ensure access to life-saving confidential domestic violence shelter for all survivors of intimate partner violence across the spectrum of gender identity and sexual orientation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify you before today. My name is Jimmy Marr, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I am a policy director at Safe Horizon. Safe Horizon is the nation's leading victim assistance organization and New York City's largest provider of services to victims and survivors of crime and violence, their families, and communities. I'm here today to offer information about Safe Horizon's role connecting transgender, gender non-conforming, and non-binary folks to domestic violence shelter, and I'm also here to offer Safe Horizon's strong support of Councilmember Lewis's resolution calling for the New York State Legislature to, to, to pass Assembly Bill 2381. This legislation would authorize shelters for victims of domestic violence to be reimbursed for any payment differential for housing a single individual in a room intended for double occupancy. Safe Horizon operates New York City's 24-hour domestic violence hotline. Our hotline, advocate, our hotline advocates offer personalized, non-judgmental support to survivors of domestic violence and provide safety planning and information about local resources. Our hotline is also the centralized intake for survivors seeking emergency domestic violence shelter placement. A major obstacle facing many survivors is difficulty accessing DV shelter as a single adult. Based on our data, this obstacle may be felt acutely by TGNC and B survivors. We have some data on the number of TGNC and B survivors calling the hotline for shelter. 
Though, of course, trans, gender nonconforming, and non-binary survivors calling our hotline may not disclose their gender identity, identity for any number of reasons, including the fear of discrimination. We do not require callers to disclose this information, and those who do disclose do so voluntarily. In FY19, of the thousands of single adults who called seeking shelter placement, 35, or 1%, identified their gender as trans or other. Only three people identifying their gender as trans or other sought placement with one or more children. In FY19, the hotline provided telephonic services to 7,586 unique callers seeking placement in emergency DV shelter. 3,328, or about 44%, of those callers seeking shelter placement were single adults. This category of survivors, single adults with no children, was the largest category of survivors calling for shelter. Although 44% of hotline callers seeking shelter were single adults, we were only able to link 33% of these callers to shelter. By comparison, 16% of our hotline callers were from a family of three, typically a mother and two children, and we were able to link 73% of these callers to shelter. 30% of our hotline callers were from family, families of two, typically a mother and one child, and we were able to link 75% of these callers to shelter. These numbers refer to callers being linked to a provider for that organization's own assessment, not callers actually being accepted into shelter. This barrier to shelter is why we support Assembly Bill 2381. Um, in addition to managing the hotline, Safe Horizon also operates six emergency DV shelters and two transitional or two-tier two shelters um, across New York City. We currently provide 745 beds across these eight shelters. Our confidential DV shelters provide healing environments for families and individuals leaving a dangerous situation. Uh, we provide on-site mental health treatment at two of our shelters, and we offer economic empowerment programming at all of our shelters. We have an agreement with AVP, uh, which works with LGBTQ plus survivors, to set aside three beds for AVP clients. Sometimes we have up to four additional beds available in another one of our shelters, and I wanna stress that these beds are a minimum, not the only beds available to queer and trans folks, though of course we understand all of the barriers that we've heard about today. Um, TGNC and B survivors face all the same obstacles and challenges that many cisgender survivors do, trauma, confusing and controlling systems, economic insecurity, the Herculean task of finding affordable permanent housing, et cetera, but they also face discrimination, hate, and additional forms of violence. Um, I'll share one story from one of my colleagues in uh, one of our DV shelters. Um, a survivor, a trans woman of color in her 30s, entered one of our DV shelters after her partner threatened her with a gun. She escaped and temporarily stayed with her mother. She never called the police because she did not feel safe to do so. She, she expressed how difficult finding safe, secure, affordable housing is, and she stated that DHS shelters are not safe. During her DV shelter stay, a roommate in her safe dwelling apartment expressed anger and frustration to be living with a transgender person and having to explain to her teenage son what transgender means. Our shelter staff mediated, um, and our client explored living with her mother but felt ambivalent because her mother did not accept her being trans. When her time in shelter ended, she left to stay with a friend. Um, but of course, this isn't an option for all survivors. Um, we we, uh, Safe Horizon strives to be an inclusive, accepting, healing environment for all survivors. Uh, when it comes to serving LGBTQ plus survivors, um, and more specifically, TGNC and B survivors, we train and support staff, um, but we can, of course, always do much better. We are grateful for our relationship with AVP. We have leaned on and learned from AVP's expertise countless times, whether for training staff on LGBTQ terminology 101 and TGNC and B awareness, consulting on individual cases, or advocating together around macro level issues facing survivors. And our shelter staff are guided by the Shelter Access Toolkit created by the New York State LGBTQ Intimate Partner Violence Network, which is coordinated by AVP. Um, just quickly, because of the challenges facing single adults trying to access DV shelters, Safe Horizon strongly supports um, the Assembly Bill, uh, which will increase the availability of domestic violence shelter options for single adult victims of domestic violence, sexual abuse, and trafficking. The bill will ensure that domestic violence shelter providers who accommodate a single adult in a room designed for two individuals will receive a differential to preserve the existing per diem rate. Across the state, but particularly in New York City, the emergency DV shelter system was configured for families. Most rooms are designed to hold a family of two, three, or more. Single adults seeking safety in a DV shelter face significant obstacles in obtaining this needed program. Uh, this bill will require New York State to preserve the full reimbursement rate for providers who downsize a room configured for a family of two to accommodate a single adult individual. By removing the financial barrier for DV, um, 
for domestic violence shelter providers to house single adults, the bill will give greater access to the domestic violence shelter system to single adults who otherwise face considerable obstacles to accessing the shelter system. Um, our DV hotline receives many requests from individuals seeking shelter, and while the city has added more shelter capacity for single adult victims of domestic violence, emergency shelter options for single adults continue to be extremely limited. By allowing shelter providers greater flexibility to downsize a room meant for two people to accommodate a single adult, organizations will have increased capacity to serve single adults fleeing violence and abuse. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Can I just ask real quickly, I very much appreciate your support of the assembly and Senate bills and the change or the increase in funding. Do you um, have a, a feeling about intro 1712? Or this is reporting on the services provided to transgender, gender nonconforming individuals sort of around, you know, outreach efforts, training, stuff like that. Sure, I mean, I think that I, we can def I can definitely get back to you on that. Great, I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing, and thank you to the survivors who shared their stories today. My name is Alyssa Kyle, and I'm the director of Housing Link at New Destiny Housing, a 25-year-old nonprofit committed to ending the cycle of domestic violence and homelessness through permanent housing and services. New Destiny is also a member of the Family Homelessness Coalition. New Destiny supports the legislation put forth today and thanks the council members for their efforts to create more transparency around the New York City shelter systems. Domestic violence is one of the main drivers of family homelessness in New York City, and temporary safe shelter is a critical part of any continuum of care for survivors. However, not everyone needs to go into shelter, and as we've heard today, not everyone is able to access shelter, but it is currently one of the very few options available. All too often, survivors must choose between going into shelter or remaining in a dangerous situation. Survivors need additional options. One option is rapid rehousing, which seeks to avoid shelter altogether by quickly linking survivors with a new home. New Destiny operates Housing Link, a rapid rehousing program which has connected 100 families to new homes. Based on our experience, rapid rehousing is an innovative, cost-effective approach that reduces the number of survivors entering shelter, even in a high-cost housing market like New York. We believe rapid rehousing can be expanded successfully across the city and encourage the council to consider, fun consider funding similar initiatives and protecting and improving systems that allow survivors to access affordable housing. Currently, DHS and HPD operate a homeless set-aside program. However, DV shelters and the residents within them are not granted access. Um, additionally, the Local Law 64 will soon end all direct referrals from DV providers into re-rentals of affordable housing. We encourage the Council to consider amending and expanding these initiatives to ensure that survivors will have access to affordable housing. Safety in place is another approach which could, re which could reduce the, cost of the use of costly shelter. HRA operates a safety in place program, Home and Safe or Alternatives to Shelter. While only a small number of clients have used it thus far, it could be scaled up with three changes. One, providing temporary rental assistance to allow victims to cover housing costs. Two, conducting more nuanced safety assessments that do not rely on an order of protection to qualify for the program. And three, linking families with social services to maintain housing stability. Both rapid rehousing and safety in place complement the existing shelter system and make the services and options available to survivors more robust. They are also less expensive and less traumatic than shelter. If we are to address and reduce domestic violence in New York City, we need to provide safe options for survivors and their children who choose not to use shelter. Shelter will always be an important resource, but it should not be the only resource. We thank the Council for the opportunity to speak today and welcome any questions you may have. I just want to thank you all for the work that you're doing, and, and um, I think it's just, uh, I think it's important for this committee to acknowledge that for the most part, um, as HRA testified to, the work out there that is being done with survivors of, of intimate partner violence is being done by the not-for-profit providers and your staff. Um, and the expertise is with the not-for-profits and, and their staff and, um, and, and all of that um, all of that support that is given um, above and beyond what, what might be reimbursed in the contract, and we know how many 
um, how many of the little things there are that is that are involved in, in supporting families in such a crisis and individuals in such a crisis. Um, and, and so our goal is to make sure that, that the, the programs that are doing the work are resourced to the extent that they need to be uh, trained and that we're creating that baseline. I mean, I, I think it's really important that we're creating the baseline that is um, so that uh, the, the most um, effective providers that all of the, 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 org the organizations that are doing um, domestic violence shelters are providing the same level of service as the, the, the ones that are doing the most effective job right now. And so that's our goal. Um, and I want to thank you because I know that there's, um, you know, that the hard work is being done by you all and your staffs. So thanks. I mean, if I, if I could just add to that, I think that what we learned today was that the demands are high. Um, the reimbursement is not high enough. The reimbursement skews um, uh, who might be taken care of. And, you know, the state and the federal government and the city have to all come together to make sure we're really meeting the needs of um, the survivors. And, you know, through our work in preparing for this hearing and hearing your testimony today, there's no question, everyone's heart is in the right place. Everyone's trying to do the right thing. Um, at the end of the day, I think the fiscal constraints are meaningful and, um, you know, it's on government to step up and provide the money needed to really take care of people who are in this situation, uh, you know, for, due to no fault of their own. Um, so thank you also, I really appreciate your work, thank you. Uh, this is the, the final panel, um, Beth Hoffmeister and Jackie Simone from Legal Aid and Coalition for the Homeless, Randy Levine, Advocates for Children, Shalane Altino, Ch Sanctuary for Families, Shalana Powell, Voices of Women Organization Project, BOW, oh. and um, is, I think Jamie Pavlovich uh, has left, but, uh, okay, but I want to acknowledge that she was here. Hi, my name is Beth Hoffmeister. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society in our Homeless Rights Project. And I'm here today with uh, actually Jackie Simone from the Coalition for the Homeless, and we've submitted joint testimony. We thank both of the chairs for uh, this hearing and all the work that you've done. We did submit written testimony, and we're just gonna give brief comments because frankly, between the two survivors who testified and the providers who are doing this work every day, we, we just wanna amplify what they've said. Um, and we also want to focus on a couple issues and give our positions on the on the some of the bills that are before us today or before you today. Um, I wanted to start by just continuing to underscore some of what we heard from the particularly the survivors themselves, but how difficult it is for people to find permanent housing when they are in shelter. Um, the How's Our Future campaign, which frankly I think almost all of the providers, if not all of them here, are involved with, which supports everyone in shelter and their ability to access long-term permanent housing, um, but certainly also as it was underscored uh, in the HRA's own report and by the testimony today how important it is um, to be really looking critically at how we are supporting New Yorkers, both recent, you know, people who've just recently become New Yorkers because they're escaping violence either in their communities or different countries or what have you, or those who have been here their entire lives. So we just want to make sure that that continues to be a priority. In regard to intro 1712, we are in support of that bill. Um, as was discussed, the DV shelter system should be celebrating and, uh, and also supporting the diversity of experience of individuals who present, particularly TGNC and, and gender nonconforming non-binary individuals. I think a lot of the testimony here today really um, underscored the difference between equality and equity. 
And while it may be important that everyone's in theory being treated the same way, that doesn't necessarily mean that equity is being fulfilled, which I think is actually what the point is here and what the point of this bill hopefully will um, allow data to be able to underscore and support going forward um, so that it can actually be fair in the way that I think, as you just said, you know, I think everyone's heart is in the right place, but it's about really making sure that effectively that's happening, particularly for clients um, who are who are transgender, non-conforming, or non-binary. Um, I also just wanted to note that we, of course, uh, respect that client confidentiality is important, and I'm sure um, both uh, HRA and the providers will ensure that whatever bill gets passed will be um, supporting those needs, but that it is, we do think it's very important that this data finally be accessible. Until you spoke today that there were 50 people being turned away, that was not information that we had access to, so it was good to know. I'm gonna let uh, Jackie finish off. Hi, I'm Jackie Simone from Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, to echo what Beth said, we definitely want to reiterate that the Hauser Future NY campaign is really pressing right now. Um, we're asking Mayor de Blasio to set aside 24,000 newly constructed units out of his 300,000 unit um, affordable housing plan, specifically for homeless New Yorkers. We also would like him to preserve the affordability of 6,000 more apartments for homeless New Yorkers. The fact that 39% of the households that were discharged from DV shelters last year went directly into the DHS shelter system really underscores that we need to disrupt this cycle of homelessness for some really vulnerable New Yorkers, and we can only do that by expanding the supply of truly affordable housing. Um, regarding intro 152, we definitely support more data transparency. However, we noted that several of the data points that are listed in that bill are already reported through other sources, such as through Local Law 37 and Local Law 79. So we would encourage the council to amend the bill so that it is solely reporting on new data points that are not reported elsewhere just to maintain the continuity of data. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Randy Levine and I'm Policy Director at Advocates for Children of New York. I think a lot of important points have been made here today about women in domestic violence shelters and we just want to add a point about education and the students living in domestic violence shelters. In our work on the ground, we see a clear need for more, for more communication and coordination between the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Education to meet the needs of students living in domestic violence shelters. We've had cases in which DOE staff has contacted and provided school information to an abuser, putting the safety of families in jeopardy. The city should review all Department of Education record keeping systems to in help ensure that student information is protected and that the location of domestic violence shelters is not disclosed and must ensure that DOE staff is sufficiently trained. Furthermore, while all kindergarten through sixth grade students living in domestic violence shelters are entitled to bus service, we have seen challenges getting bus service in place. Unlike students in Department of Homeless Services family shelters, students in domestic violence shelters are not automatically provided with busing. And there's often confusion about the responsibilities of school staff members and domestic violence shelter providers in arranging transportation and entering confidential addresses. It is critical for the DOE and HRA to develop a joint protocol and training on school transportation, school enrollment, school-based safety planning, and procedures for collecting, storing, and keeping confidential information for students living in domestic violence shelters. We're also pleased that intro 152 is on today's agenda. This bill would provide important information about children living in shelters, including indicators regarding their education. For example, currently, the mayor's management report includes the percentage of families placed in a shelter in the same borough as the youngest school-age child school. Given the large size of the boroughs, we're glad to see that Intro 152 would require DHS to report the percentage of families placed in a shelter in the school district of the youngest school-age child school. We also appreciate that the bill includes various indicators regarding early childhood education for children living in shelters. 
We're attaching to our testimony a markup of the bill with recommendations to further strengthen the bill and make sure that we get the most effective data possible. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. We look forward to working with you to move forward intro 152 and strengthen education for children and youth living in shelters, including domestic violence shelters. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and this is, this is extraordinary. Thank you for the markup. And just uh, to defend my honor, all of your really good questions about DOE and the relationship with HRA were exactly the next questions that I was Thank getting you. to when unfortunately we had to cut it short. They will be the first questions listed as we send those along to HRA, and I'm glad for you to raise the issue again. We will make sure that they respond um, to that very troubling situation. So thank you for that raising. Thank you, we appreciate that. Good morning, my name is Jelaine Altino, and I'm the Deputy Clinical Director of Residential Services at Sanctuary for Families. New York State's largest provider of comprehensive services exclusively for survivors of DV and trafficking. We're grateful to the City Council for the opportunity to testify today and to Council Members Levin and Rosenthal for bringing this critical discussion of DV's shelter system to the Council's attention. We're also grateful to Human Resources Administration and Department of Social Services for being our trusted partners in providing high quality services to our residential clients. We're all aware of the crisis of poverty, homelessness, and lack of affordable housing that confronts the poorest members of our community. For more than 25 years, Sanctuary has run a large 58-family transitional shelter and four, four small crisis shelters that together provide 350 to 400 adults and children annually um, each night. Access to trauma-informed, holistic, supportive services for clients during their stay in shelter can make a huge difference in their post-shelter outcomes. HRA's uh, in Emergency Intervention Services Unit has made significant improvements in recent years. They talked about it a little earlier today. For example, facilitating a quicker turnaround time for shelter reimbursements and introducing a new voice recognition system for residents to complete daily check-ins. There are, however, a few areas that warrant attention related to the need for a more trauma-informed approach to working with families impacted by abuse. For example, in multiple instances, our shelter residents were deemed ineligible for housing vouchers based on incorrect calculations of income against federal poverty guidelines. The response from EIS is that the client should request fair hearings through another HRA department to verify the numbers. It would be of great help if HRA could investigate such errors internally through interdepartmental communication rather than burden abuse survivors with the additional stress and economic anxiety of a fair hearing. Another major concern is the complex, arguably punitive public assistance requirements placed on shelter residents in order to qualify for housing vouchers. Clients must strike a delicate balance working and showing some income, but not too much, while their voucher is pending. They may have to decline job opportunities that would disqualify them for vouchers, but not enough to pay unsubsidized rents and ensure that they never miss PA meetings, which would result in a sanction and make their voucher null and void. They must navigate this confusing bureaucracy while living in shelter and dealing with the many challenges of being a single parent recovering from trauma. The struggle to find affordable post-shelter housing remains the single most pressing issue to be addressed for residents of the city's domestic violence shelters. Voucher levels are insufficient and to meet New York City market rents and brokers rarely have apartments within reach. Landlords are still reluctant to accept vouchers because they do not want to be forced to make repairs or to rely on housing subsidy programs which come and go. Lastly, vouchers expire and take a long time to renew which can put the housing search on hold indefinitely leading to longer shelter stays or transfer to the PATH system, an unsuitable and often dangerous situation for abuse survivors and families. Annual shelter costs are far costlier than housing vouchers. At our tier two shelter, 30 days of shelter for a family of 138 per night comes to 4,000 per, per month or more than 50,000 annually. 
at our crisis shelters, we receive $125 per person per night. For a family of four, that is $498 per night, almost 15,000 per year, close to 180,000 annually. From the city's perspective, it is clearly sound economics to ease the voucher process for abuse survivors and their families so they can find permanent housing quickly and not put bureaucratic roadblocks in their way. Sanctuary does its best to mitigate the challenges our residential clients face with a rich web of supportive services to help them navigate complex systems. We know these services are critical to shelter clients establishing durable independence after they leave shelter, but shelter reimbur reimbursements do not meet the cost of even shelter-based services, let alone support critical services like our career training. Sanctuary invests over $500,000 annually to cover supportive services at our crisis and transitional shelters. Needless to say, this is not a sustainable model over the long term. Another critical issue that was talked about is the lack of shelter for single abuse survivors. Like most DV shelter providers, Sanctuary has almost exclusively family shelters, and although we periodically take a financial loss to provide safe housing to single survivors, we cannot afford to have them occupy family units on a long-term basis. HRA has been an outstanding partner in problem solving. The EIS team has been so responsive when we have concerns to address. Given that, we are confident the issues highlighted today can be effectively addressed as well. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and thank you for your work on behalf of abuse survivors and their families on their journeys from survival to safety to independence. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all of your hard work and we will be taking the suggestions that you've made today and trying to incorporate that into the language. So expect some follow-up uh, conversations. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate all the work you do every single day. Thank you. Um, there's one more person who's come forward to testify, Charlena Powell from Voices of Women Organizing Project. Good afternoon, thank you for coming and your patience. Just make sure your mic is on, the red dot is. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon to the Committee on General Welfare and all those present in the room and City Council. My name is Charlena Powell and I'm a proud survivor and advocate working with the Voices of Women Organizing Project, VOW. At VOW, we are a domestic violence survivor-led organization that has been built on improving the systems that survivors and their children turn to for safety and justice. The overarching goal at VOW is to implement strategies to hold accountable governmental systems that should protect survivors and their families from violence and poverty and aid them in the efforts to break the cycle of violence, most specifically the child welfare family court, and homelessness systems. Through training workshops, leadership opportunities, and healing activities, VOW members gain the skills and confidence needed to analyze uh, practices and attitudes, document systemic failures, create recommendations, and meet with public officials and engage in important policy debates. Domestic violence should never equal homelessness. After, after uh, although that has been the fate of countless survivors who have exhausted their stay at domestic violence emergency shelter upon fleeing abuse. As the housing reform campaign chairperson at VOW, part of our goals in relation to our mission is to educate fellow incoming survivors of domestic violence on the housing systems so that they are truly empowered by knowing how to navigate New York City's complex housing market. Within our plan of action, we have hosted and facilitated community focus groups on current solutions or lack thereof for survivors in need of rebuilding their lives and developing individualized plans in obtaining safe and affordable housing and the prevention of revictimization and recidivism. We support Councilman Levin for the previous intent number 152 proposed in early 2018 on data collection for the total number of families with children living in shelter 
to permanent housing, disaggregated by shelter placement, A, a tier two facility, uh, B, a domestic violence shelter, C, a HASA shelter, D, a DYCD administ administered crisis shelter, E, cluster site, and F, hotels. We would like to include data, data services for those who have been accommodated with a city FEPS voucher or supplement, and as well as of account of unknown residency or a return to their originally abusive intimate partner. We also concur with identifying the percentage of families with, living, with children living in shelter in the same zip code or nearby zip code within the respective zone or borough where the family receives community-based preventative services. Due to the projected uncertainty of a survivor's fam family leaving shelter and establishing sustainability in a likely unknown neighborhood, it is imperative that the family receive adequate options for long-term planning, along with financial stability goals and technological savvy assistance beyond their state of crisis. We recommend that this overdue proposal in local law should have a level of urgency in order to uncover the necessary steps needed to ensure survivor safety within their home, along with transparency measures needed at the New York City Human Resources Administration, or HRA, and case management services. Thank you to those who are listening and who look forward to working with you in your respective communities. Thank you. I really appreciate your coming and providing testimony. Did you happen to bring copies? Yes. Oh, okay, we'll get them. Um, and thank you for bringing your personal point of view and continuing your fight. We heard you, and um, I've been taking notes. I really like the, I especially appreciate the, uh, your, your bringing up the very important point of having a sense of urgency. I think that wraps back to the, our, just the beginning of our whole hearing and sums it all up that we need to make sure everyone has this strong sense of urgency. Every day that passes, you know, it results in a continued crisis for many families out there. So mm -hmm. thank you for staying. We really appreciate your testimony. Okay, thank you. With that, I'm gonna call the hearing to a close again. Oh, actually, just one more quick thing to reiterate to the administration. And for, uh, because of some timing problems, we were not able to um, articulate all of our questions. We will be sending them over to the administration quickly and um, really appreciate the agreement that we would get the answers back within two weeks. That could be written, that could be a combination of written and a meeting, however you'd like to do it, but that, according to my book, is uh, October 15th. So I just wanna make sure that's all said and agreed to on the record, I see nodding. Uh, from administration representatives. So thank you everyone for this hearing. Really appreciate everyone's time. The hearing is closed. All right. Very good.